Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start in two minutes. Can we please take our seats? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Her Excellency Ms. Doris Lethard, President of the Swiss Confederation. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now we will have the pleasure to enjoy a cultural performance by Swiss artist Enrico Lenzen. Enrico Lenzen is known for a cool combination of Swiss musical tradition with modern style, using digital technology to create a new music musical experience. He is the holder of multiple national awards and has performed in numerous national and international events. Enjoy. Thank you.
Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 12th meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. It is my honor to give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Doris Leuthard, President of the Swiss Confederation. Mesdames, Messieurs les chefs d'État de gouvernement, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs les ministres, Monsieur le secrétaire général de l'UIT, Madame la directrice générale de l'UNESCO, Mesdames et Messieurs, je suis ravie de vous accueillir ici à Genève pour la douzième forum des Nations Unies sur la gouvernance de l'Internet. C'est à deux pas d'ici, Mesdames et Messieurs, que Sir Timothy Turner Berners-Lee a inventé le World Wide Web au CERN en 1989. Et c'est ici à Genève que furent lancés en 2003, dans le cadre du sommet mondial sur la société de l'information, un nouveau dialogue international et un nouveau concept politique, celui d'une gouvernance d'Internet multipartite. Pour la première fois dans l'histoire des Nations Unies, les États ont invité le secteur privé et la société civile a participé au débat sur un pied d'égalité. Naturellement, nous sommes fiers que le forum de FTI 2017 puisse profiter de la solide expérience de la Genève internationale dans de nombreux thèmes centraux pour la numérisation. Aujourd'hui, ce forum représente l'une des plateformes majeures pour permettre un dialogue entre toutes les parties prenantes dans un format inclusif, interactif et ouvert sur tous les aspects liés à l'utilisation de l'Internet et aux principes de sa gouvernance. Le Forum a réussi à faire inscrire de nouveaux thèmes relatifs à la gouvernance de l'Internet dans l'agenda international grâce à des partenariats et en facilitant des solutions au sein d'institutions existantes. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, l'avènement du numérique transforme de manière fulgurante le monde. Des thèmes comme l'accès de tous à l'Internet, 
l'impact de la numérisation sur les objectifs de développement durable, mais aussi la cybersécurité doivent être traités de concert. Le dialogue est essentiel si nous voulons matérialiser une société de l'information à dimension humaine, inclusif et privilégiant le développement conforme à la vision formulée par les sommets mondiaux en 2003 et 2005. Les valeurs et les principes de la coopération et de l'engagement multipartite demande un investissement de toutes les parties concernantes, qu'il s'agisse des organisations internationales, du secteur privé, de la société civile, de la communauté technique et universitaire, des agences de l'ONU ou des gouvernements. Les clés résident dans une coopération constructive, l'amélioration de l'échange d'informations sur les projets en cours, l'identification conjointe de thèmes et d'interfaces intersectorielles pertinents, ainsi que des partenariats forts entre tous les acteurs. Au niveau national, la Suisse s'est dotée de deux instruments. Premièrement, nous avons développé en avril 2010, euh, 2016 la Suisse numérique et, deuxièmement, un dialogue constant avec tous les acteurs de la numérisation. La stratégie suisse numérique indique comment et dans quel domaine les autorités, l'économie, les milieux scientifiques, la société civile et les acteurs politiques doivent collaborer afin que la Suisse puisse tirer pleinement profit de ce processus de transformation et que toute notre société peut profiter de ces développements. Simultanément, un processus de dialogue national mettant en réseau tous les groupes d'intérêt concernés a été mis en œuvre pour favoriser la collaboration de tous les niveaux de l'administration avec les représentants de l'économie, de la société civile, du monde politique et des milieux scientifiques. Un petit IGF au niveau suisse. Et je peux vous dire, les expériences sont vraiment très, très bien parce que cette idée d'inclusivité, du dialogue avec tous qui ont quelque chose à dire, euh, ça me plaît beaucoup et j'espère que ça vous plaira aussi. Au niveau international, la Suisse est fermement convaincue de l'intérêt d'investir dans un système multilatéral et multipartite qui fonctionne notamment dans le domaine de l'Internet. L'idée de renforcer la coopération entre les gouvernements et avec tous les acteurs ne date pas d'hier, mais elle se concrétise encore trop rarement et souvent de façon inadéquate. La mise en réseau de tous les acteurs ne fera pas tout. Il faut aussi une ouverture d'esprit et le respect des valeurs et des besoins de tous les groupes d'acteurs. Il faut trouver de nouvelles manières de connecter les acteurs, de leur fournir des véritables occasions d'échanger leurs expériences et leurs meilleures pratiques et s'aborder les défis auxquels ils sont confrontés. Si on ne trouve pas des plateformes de dialogue, si on ne trouve pas des pratiques qui tout le monde adapte et qui convainc, autrement la politique un jour va réglementer. Et ce n'est pas ce que nous voulons. Nous voulons la liberté et le dialogue et un consensus de ce qui est important, de ce qu'il faut réglementer et de ce que nous pouvons faire ensemble avec des règles communes. Je suis convaincue que ce forum présente une opportunité cruciale d'approfondir notre coopération dans ce sens que nous devons saisir tous ensemble. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, avec le forum de cette année, nous faisons un pas important pour renforcer ce forum clé pour l'avenir de la numérisation. Sous le titre « Shape your digital future », façonnez votre avenir numérique, ce forum mettra l'accent sur les intérêts des citoyens de l'économie 
et de la politique. Les thèmes que nous discuterons cette année résultent d'un processus pour de MOP. Il n'y a pas de sujet tabou. Tous les sujets figurent à l'agenda public accepté par les participants. Le forum de cette année se concentre en particulier sur les sujets clés sortissant de la transformation numérique. À cet égard, le vaste programme touchera la politique des données, très important pour les gouvernements, la cybersécurité, économie et politique ont une idée là-dessus, le fossé numérique, notamment entre les sexes, le développement durable, universel et les changements dans la communication médiatique. Nous espérons que les discussions et échanges des prochains jours contribueront de manière décisive à trouver des réponses communes aux défis d'une numérisation qui bouleverse fondamentalement notre vie et que les informations et les outils fournis par la Geneva Internet Platform, soutenue par la Suisse, vous y seraient utiles. Nous vous encouragerons à continuer à bâtir les fondements d'une société de l'information, solidaire et ouverte, qui ouvre les portes d'un futur numérique commun plus juste et plus équitable. Au nom du Conseil fédéral suisse, du Conseil d'État et de la République et canton de Genève, ainsi du Conseil administratif de la ville de Genève, j'ai le plaisir de vous inviter à une réception qui se tiendra de 18h30 ce soir dans les locaux de l'Organisation mondiale de la propriété intellectuelle. Mesdames, Messieurs, je vous remercie de votre attention. Je vous souhaite un bon séjour ici à Genève et je vous encourage d'être courageux. Merci, mesdames, messieurs. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now, we will have a video message from the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres. The internet and new technologies in general have an immense role to play in helping us address global sustainable development challenges. But there is a growing danger that the internet can be used for polarization, division and criminal activity. We must ensure that it serves to improve the human condition. And that means bridging digital divides based on locality, means and gender. And it means establishing governance that supports innovation while respecting human rights and protecting society. I wish you a successful forum. The United Nations looks forward to working with all of you to realize the vast promise of the Internet for a better world for all. I now have the honor to give the floor to the Under Secretary General of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Liu Jianmen. Your Excellency, Madame Bertard, President of the Swiss Confederation. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United Nations Secretary General, I'm honored to welcome you all to the 12th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, this is the second time the, for the forum is taking place in, at your premises. After 2011 IGF in Nairobi, I'm also honored to welcome you to the United Nations. We are now in Geneva the place where the foundations of this forum were set. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind us all about how the forum was created and why. Exactly 14 years ago, in December, 23, uh, December 2003, the government of Switzerland hosted the first phase of the World Summit on the Information Society, the 
voices. The summit was focused on identifying concrete action lines to advance the information society and the use of information and communications technologies as tools for development. The summit brought into focus the concept of internet governance, which remains critical today for developing internet policy in an open, transparent, inclusive, and multi-stakeholder manner. The final document of the Geneva Summit requested the United Nations Secretary General to set up a multi-stakeholder working group on internet governance, whose report, released in June 2005, paved the way to the establishment of the Internet Governance Forum. The Tunisia Agenda on the Information Society, adopted at the end of the second phase of WISIS in November 2005, considered the recommendations of the working group and mandated the United Nations Secretary General to convene the Internet Governance Forum. Today, the IGF and the multi-stakeholder open and inclusive forum on internet-related policy issues remains vital. Twelve years on, the forum is returning to Geneva, a place where it all started. I would like to thank the government of Switzerland for hosting us here. Madam President and Madam and Mr. Modé, the Conseil d'État, and Mr. Pagani, the mayor of Geneva, thank you for being our host. Geneva is a host of home to many international and intergovernmental organizations. This IGF is a timely opportunity to further integrate the experience and expertise of these organizations into a global internet governance process. I was fortunate to work with many of them during my service as a permanent representative of China to the United Nations Office in Geneva and other international organizations in Switzerland from 2012 to 2013. So it is also homecoming for me on a personal level. Why did I start with such a history lesson? Simply because I believe that while we try to prepare ourselves for the future, we should always be aware of the past to understand why we are where we are. Over the past 12 years, the IGF has made crucial contributions to public policy on the Internet, from human rights online to cybersecurity to critical Internet resources and to harnessing the Internet for sustainable development. The world has undoubtedly changed since 2003, and the Internet has changed too. In 2003, we were talking about the information society. Now we talk about digital economy, front issues, digitalization, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence, among others. The Internet and digital technologies have become more and more part of our lives and societies. The challenge we face is how to harness the technologies to maximize the benefits to society while minimizing the negative impact. The theme of this year's IGF is Ship Your, future, ship your Digital Future. A key question is how we can make sure that the information and the communication technologies do not create more divides among people and regions, and how we shape our digital future in a way that bridges the divides and brings societies together, not just today's generations, but also tomorrow's. This is where the IGF continues to add value, by serving as an open and inclusive space that fosters discussions and collaborations on these critical policy issues. The United Nations General Assembly recognized this relevance and the potential of the IGF when it renewed the mandate of IGF in 2015. The renewal of the IGF mandate 
came just a few months after adoption of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. The importance of information and communication technologies is elaborated as a part of the SDG 4, SDG 5, SDG 9, and the SDG 17. I want to draw your attention to SDG 9, which calls for significantly increasing access to information and communication technology and striving to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developed countries by 2020. Achieving this target is just three years away. I believe the outcome of the IGF community's work will be a valuable contribution toward, I, toward the SDGs and a more inclusive and sustainable digital future for all. As the week ahead unfolds, I hope it will give you more reasons to continue to be part of the IGF process, globally, but also within your regions and countries. I wish you all to have a fruitful discussion and a pleasant stay in Geneva. I thank you. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General. I would not now like to call upon the Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, where we're holding our meeting here, Mr. Michael Muller, to give an address. Thank you. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Palais des Nations today and to share some brief thoughts at the outset of this year's meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. But before I do, let me first express our gratitude to the Government of Switzerland for hosting this year IGF in Geneva, which really is the natural home for Internet Governance. It is the home of key actors in the digital space, from CERN, the inventor of the World Wide Web, to the International Telecommunications Union. Its diverse ecosystem and pioneering mindset makes Geneva the place where digital innovation is fostered, where digital policies are debated, and where global implementation is agreed. Today, over 3.5 billion people connect to the Internet through more than 8 billion devices. A hypothetical visitor from the past would wonder about many things in our world today, but probably nothing would take the visitor's breath away quite as much as browsing the internet. It has compressed time and space, allowing you to speak, chat, or even see your friends in Lagos while you sit in a cafe in Milan. It can deliver the entirety of human knowledge on a single handheld device. The answer to the question of who was the king of England in 1620 or how to make guacamole are literally seconds away. But for all its wonders, the internet and technological progress more generally has also produced a series of challenges we have only just begun to focus on. Technology has equipped some governments with the means for surveillance of almost anyone, anywhere, at any time. Technology has given some private IT companies so much power that they can even influence election outcomes. They collect so much data about you and me, they may even know more about us than we do ourselves. Technology has increased the risk of conflict as a new arms race is gaining speed in weaponized robotics and artificial intelligence. Cyberspace is a new battlefield, co-equal with combat on land, sea, and air. Algorithm, algorithms can be as powerful as tanks, bots as destructive as bombs. And technology has strained society's cohesion as it shifts the distribution of income from labor to capital. Automation creates new opportunities, but threatens to make almost half of all existing jobs redundant. And how can we train the millions of jobless people so that they can acquire the necessary qualifications for the new jobs that will be created? Taken together, yesterday's optimism has somehow given way to today's trust deficit. To safeguard the good and tame the bad of tomorrow's technologies, we are faced with an urgent governance challenge. And this governance challenge will hardly be solved through traditional forms of regulation, although they certainly have a role to play. But the pace and scale of technological innovation is so swift and so broad, traditional regulation as managed by governments or intergovernmental organizations invariably fails to keep up. 
which means that the only way to establish mechanisms of regulation fit for our brave new digital world will have to be different. It will need to be people-centered and inclusive, combining all stakeholders, governments, companies, scientists, civil society and academia. All of them are present here today in Geneva, making it the place to develop the regulatory frameworks we need, flexible enough to allow for innovation to prosper, but protective enough to preserve the social cohesion of our societies. This, is a nut in a nutshell, is the ambition and the value of the UN Internet Governance Forum, and it is also your challenge the next couple of days. And I wish you much success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General. I would now like to give the floor to the Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union, Mr. Hulin Zhao. Madam President, Switzerland, Mr. Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Director General of UNOC, Mr. Assistant Director General of uh, UNESCO, Monsieur le Conseil Cantonal, and Monsieur le Maire de Genève. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So much progress has been made in information and communication technologies over the past two decades. ICTs has transformed people's lives around the world, and they have a critical role to play in helping to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So much of this progress is thanks to the World Summit on the Information Society. 14 years ago, exactly December this month, the first phase of the WISIS was taken place right here in Geneva. And the second phase was here in Tunisia, November 2005. Out of this process emerged the Internet Governance Forum, IGF, and the WISIS Forum. And these two major platforms have been working side by side ever since. I'm really pleased to see the IGF this year take place in Geneva for the first time after the WISIS process. My heartfelt congratulations to all those who have made it possible. It is good to see voices, faces, from the government, private sector, the international organizations, NGOs, end users, and the public, all in one place to discuss internet governance issues. ITU fully supports the open and inclusive discussion platform like IGF. We ourselves, have a long-standing history of working with all different stakeholders. The WISIS Forum is a good example, co-organized by ITU, UNESCO, UNCTAC, and UNDP. This forum has become the world's leading ICT for development event, and I invite you all to join our next event, March next year in Geneva. Ladies and gentlemen, as we reflect on what ICTs have achieved over the last decade and look to the future, let's remember that still 3.9 billion people are not connected online yet. As the UN Specialized Agency for ICTs, ITU's core mission is to connect the world people whenever they live and whatever their means. We develop global standards on communication technologies and services, manage spectrum and satellite orbits, and assist the developing countries for infrastructure and policy development on ICT. We are working on a range of emerging technologies from cloud computing to big data to artificial intelligence to the Internet of Things and, of course, 4G and 5G. By we, I mean ITU, our membership of 193 member states, 
and over 800 private sector entities, international and regional organizations, academia, and civil society, including those technical giants like Google, Facebook, and Alibaba, who joined us since 2015 and 2016. Because partnerships are essential, ITU and IGF are strong partners, and I'm happy to see our cooperation with organizations like ICON also further strengthened. Ladies and gentlemen, cooperation is what brings us here today. Cooperation, coordination, and collaboration are at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which will shape our digital future, the theme of this year's IGF. Together, we need to face the challenges and opportunities of the digital revolution. And I'm, uh, promised, I can promise that the ITU will continue to play its part to join all of you work on those issues. I wish you a pleasant stay in Geneva and wish you a very successful IGF 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. I now have the pleasure to call the Assistant Director General of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, Mr. Frank LaRue. Madam President of the Confederation of the Swiss Confederation, uh, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, uh, UN re representative of the UN office in Geneva, Director General of ITU, State Council representative in Switzerland, and Mayor of the City of Geneva, and all friends, women and men here present today who are joining efforts and minds to celebrate and to promote a free and open internet for everyone in the world. It's with great pleasure that I bring the congratulations of the Director General of UNESCO, Madame Audrey Azoulay, to the Swiss Confederation for having sponsored this event in, um, we understand, in very hasty and difficult circumstances, but a very important decision to be able to carry out progressively every single year uh, an, an IGF meeting. For us, from UNESCO, it's very important to understand that the building of internet began with the sharing of knowledge between academics. And it pretty soon be became a necessity for everyone in society. And eventually, states understood that it was the sharing of information and knowledge to build knowledge societies and to be able to develop democracies with participation of citizens, but also to reach democratic development and sustainable development. And in this process, in the WISI summit, as was mentioned here in Geneva, there was a decision to have everyone participate in a way on formulating suggestions and having a say in the policies of governance of internet in 2006, the first IGF meeting in Athens. And since then, subsequently, the meetings have remained. I remember that initially the decision was for five years, just to see how this experiment could carry out. But five years went by, and everyone was satisfied. And the nature of the debates began to change. Because obviously, internet technologies and ICTs were moving ahead but also the needs of societies were changing. And very soon it was obvious that the internet has a role for every sector of society, and internet satisfied the needs of everyone, and that it was important to listen to everyone through the experts that knew about internet, whether they were academics that began the internet, whether they were government officials that would formulate the regulations, whether they were enterprises that would develop the inventions or commercialize them, or whether there were civil society organizations defending the rights of the, of the people. 
in different forms. And this became a very rich dialogue where we were able to talk about sharing information but with gender equity. We were able to talk about accessibility to people for, with people with disabilities. Or we were able to talk about rural internet and development in the rural areas. And progressively, the debate began changing. I believe there's only one area in which we have not been successful. We have also been able to reach cultural diversity and the dimension of linguistic expressions around the world, to which we still have to grow, but has progressed in time. But the one issue that we still, I think, have lacking is the possibility of making internet a stronger and better peace builder by sharing the information. UNESCO in its constitution has a beautiful phrase that says, it is an institution to build peace by facilitating the free flow of ideas and knowledge between peoples of the world. Well, this free flow of ideas and knowledge is basically the role of internet as well. And this is why we all believe in an internet, but an internet that satisfies the needs of all sectors and that leaves all societies in a better stage. And this is why we keep on meeting. But today, I would say, we have a bigger challenge. And it has already been mentioned by two of my predecessors. Today, we're moving into a different era of ICTs and digital communication and internet. We're talking about internet of things. We're talking about analysis of big data. We're talking about questions of privacy or not privacy. Or we're talking about issues that will relate to artificial intelligence. And will that provoke unemployment or not? We're moving into a new phase that can have beautiful opportunities for development, but will also have tremendous challenges. So this dialogue that is beginning today in Geneva is much more important today than it ever was before, because it is much more complex. And the challenges for us to understand the internet and to share our views is much more important. Because we also have the fact that violence has also grown. Harassment of women on internet or issues of extremism and violence online or cyberbullying or other problems have also grown. And many of the states have brought it to our attention. And we have to begin thinking of how to respond to that, keeping in mind that this is a, a, an element that has to have a free flow of communication. Well, these are the challenges that we have in front of us. At UNESCO, there was a conference a few years ago connecting the dots where there was at least four basic principles defined, the Rome principles, R-O-A-M, which were that UNESCO should at least have always a rights-oriented approach, a fundamental human rights approach that is essentially the mandate of the United Nations as a whole. Secondly, it should be open, neutral, and respond to all. Thirdly, it should be accessible, so which we should increase the accessibility and the connectivity, but all different forms of connectivity, and find the appropriate content. And the fourth, the M, is the multi-stakeholder dialogue. Why a multi-stakeholder dialogue, which is obviously a very difficult phenomenon? Because this will allow those that define the regulations or corporations that define the design of new products or the policies uh, for, for, for internet in the future, their social responsibility policies, or those that are dealing with the way that, that, that the human rights are being seen by society, we have to define something that builds on common standards, an equal understanding of how internet is a service for all, which is why we cannot privilege internet from one society to another or from one sector of society to another or from one region of the world, or one gender to another, or one class or social area to another. We have to build the possibility of a policy of internet that responds to all those needs. And here, let me finish with saying that in this challenge, we have the new agenda set by United Nations, and that uh, Secretary General Gutierrez has very much insisted on the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development Goals. But the bottom line of these goals is the access to information. And we have goal 16 that fundamentally says that in order to reach development, we must have societies in peace, with inclusiveness, 
with justice, transparency, and full access to information. Full access to information means a free internet, an open internet, an accessible internet, a internet that serves the building of knowledge societies for everyone, and that does not represent a danger for anyone. This is our challenge, how to make internet an instrument of development and an instrument of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Leroux. Our next speaker is Mr. Pierre Modet, State Council of the Republic and the Canton of Geneva. Madame la Présidente de la Confédération, Monsieur le Directeur Général de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, Monsieur le Sous-Secrétaire Général, Monsieur l'Assistant Directeur Général, Monsieur le Maire, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs. C'est un grand honneur et un grand plaisir aussi de vous recevoir à Genève à l'occasion de ce douzième forum de la gouvernance d'Internet. Nous devons en grande partie notre présence ici aujourd'hui à une manifestation qui a eu lieu en 2003 à Genève et qui s'est poursuivie en 2005 à Tunis. Le Sommet mondial de la société de l'information a lancé le Forum international de la gouvernance d'Internet et a consolidé l'approche multipartite de la gouvernance d'Internet. Il apparaît donc important que le Forum s'arrête à nouveau à Genève, une cité qui concentre un nombre unique d'organisations et de sociétés actives sur le front d'Internet. Tous les jours, mesdames et messieurs, des centaines de personnes dans cette ville, dans les organisations intergouvernementales de l'ONU, dans les organisations internationales telles le Comité international de la Croix-Rouge et du Croissant Rouge, dans les organisations non gouvernementales, dans les associations, dans les fondations, ces personnes se battent pour rendre Internet plus accessible, plus performant, plus libre, plus ouvert, mais aussi plus profitable, profitable au bénéfice de tous, bien sûr. À l'heure où certains menacent la neutralité d'Internet, à l'heure où l'on parle chaque jour davantage des risques plus que des opportunités du big data, de l'intelligence artificielle, mais également de la potentielle identité des robots, il est plus que jamais nécessaire de réunir les experts dans ce domaine. De les réunir autour de l'idée qu'Internet est une révolution permanente, une révolution qui, par nature, doit être solidaire. Le mot d'ordre de ce douzième forum est « Shape your digital future ». Façonnez votre digital numérique. Pour pouvoir façonner son avenir numérique, il faut non seulement maîtriser les outils, mais aussi avoir confiance, confiance dans ces outils et dans les partenaires avec lesquels on va composer l'avenir. La sécurité est ainsi devenue l'un des enjeux majeurs d'Internet, avec des avis très contradictoires sur les mesures à adopter par les différentes administrations. L'enjeu de la sécurité est à la fois celui de l'Internet, au niveau de l'infrastructure, mais aussi sur l'Internet, sur les contenus. À Genève, nous avons entamé les Geneva Digital Talks pour que toutes les parties concernées, les administrations publiques d'une part, les entreprises informatiques, les fameuses GAFAM de l'autre, mais aussi les milieux académiques, les organisations non gouvernementales et également les représentants de la société civile puissent discuter librement de leur vision d'un Internet plus sûr, non seulement à tous les niveaux, mais aussi pour l'ensemble des utilisateurs. Nous présenterons le résultat de ces discussions lors de ce forum et je me réjouis d'en discuter avec vous. Vous êtes dans un pays, dans une cité où, vous le savez, nous avons érigé la complexité en un art que nous arrivons à représenter à travers l'horlogerie. Nous aimons les mécaniques complexes. Internet est complexe et il n'y a pas de meilleur endroit pour discuter de cette complexité qu'ici, en particulier à Genève, cité de Calvin, qui a fait de l'éthique le cadre nécessaire au développement de toute activité humaine. 
Nous sommes convaincus qu'Internet est un outil formidablement puissant pour façonner notre avenir. Mais comme dans nos sociétés physiques et analogiques, nous devons nous assurer que notre avenir numérique est le plus inclusif et le plus respectueux de tous. Nous sommes donc heureux de vous voir ici, en Suisse, et nous sommes persuadés que la Suisse a de bonnes expériences à partager. Nous nous réjouissons également de vous entendre et de partager vos expériences afin de façonner notre avenir numérique ensemble. Je vous souhaite un douzième forum de la gouvernance d'Internet aussi productif que constructif et je vous remercie de votre participation, que ce soit ici à Genève ou en ligne partout autour du monde. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Maudet. Our final speaker for the opening ceremony is the mayor of the Canton of Geneva, Mr. Remy Pagani. Madame la Présidente de la Confédération, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général adjoint aux Affaires économiques et sociales des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Directeur Général de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général de l'Union Internationale des Télécommunications, Monsieur le Sous-Directeur Général pour la Communication et l'Information de l'UNESCO, Monsieur le Conseiller d'État, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, Chers Amis, Chers Amis. En ma qualité de maire de Genève, c'est un plaisir et un honneur de vous souhaiter à toutes et à tous une très cordiale bienvenue à Genève, qui a le privilège de vous accueillir à l'occasion de cette douzième rencontre annuelle du Forum sur la gouvernance Internet. Notre ville est très heureuse de pouvoir ainsi permettre aux nombreux acteurs de disposer d'une plateforme d'échange, de dialogue de grande qualité sur des thèmes liés à l'évolution de la gouvernance Internet. Il est aujourd'hui indéniable que la croissance de ce réseau ainsi que sa pénétration grandissante dans l'ensemble des sphères de la société en font un centre incontestable d'enjeux économiques, politiques et sociaux. En tant que responsable d'une collectivité publique qui réfléchit à la façon de mettre en place des politiques publiques performantes et adaptées aux besoins de la population, la question liée aux avancées technologiques et aux possibilités offertes par Internet est évidemment cruciale. En effet, de nombreux problèmes sont à relever. La transition numérique est la propriété de toutes les organisations publiques ou privées, avec pour effet une guerre planétaire financière qui se livre en ce moment même, mesdames et messieurs. De même, la fracture numérique n'a pas été résorbée entre les pays de, en développement et les pays développés. Il nous faut donc garantir l'accès à une utilisation égalitaire à Internet. Internet est pour moi un bien commun précieux qui fait partie du patrimoine de l'humanité tout entière. C'est un outil fantastique, tout dont le potentiel au service de la démocratie, de la culture, de la paix et du renforcement des droits économiques et sociaux de la majorité des habitantes et des habitants de cette planète est considérable. Les décisions récentes prises il y a quelques jours seulement par l'administration Trump aux États-Unis, cassant la neutralité du net, sont en ce sens plus que préoccupantes. Elles incarnent, comme d'ailleurs les éléments apparus dans le cadre des négociations TISA, une volonté de découpage et de marchandisation d'Internet pour en faire encore plus et une fois de plus un espace où domine le capital à la recherche de profits, un espace où les règles du jeu de la démocratie et de l'égalité reculent devant le pouvoir des grandes co corporations. David Bollier a écrit plusieurs ouvrages sur le bien commun, sur ce bien commun en particulier. Pour lui, le principe de neutralité est un, un élément central grâce auquel Internet permet autant de création. Je le cite. « Parce que Internet fonctionne comme un bien commun, il permet à n'importe qui de trouver d'autres personnes, d'établir une collaboration et de créer des choses nouvelles sans payer un tarif préférentiel, réunir du capital » ou persuader des entrepreneurs qu'il s'agit d'une idée commercialisable. Cela n'a rien de nouveau, mesdames et messieurs. En France, après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, au sortir de la nuit hitlérienne, le Conseil national de la résistance proclamait déjà la neutralité de la correspondance et l'appliquait à la poste. Aujourd'hui, à Genève, en Suisse, comme d'ailleurs 
comme ailleurs, la défense du service public postal, précisément contre les privatisations et leurs effets, est toujours une bataille populaire importante. En matière d'Internet, les enjeux de la bataille sont aussi immenses. L'égalité, la transparence, la régulation démocratique plutôt que la mercantilisation à tout craint, voilà que ce débat, ce que, débat, ce que vous allez débattre ces prochains jours. Cette, ce débat est en vos, entre vos mains. Je souhaite que votre forum connaisse des travaux productifs dans ce sens. Ainsi, il me paraît fondamental que l'on puisse, dans la perspective de, du tout numérique, maintenir ce service public accessible à toutes et à tous au centre des préoccupations. De la même manière, on assiste aujourd'hui à une véritable explosion du développement des solutions mobiles avec l'instauration de politiques de la donnée comme enjeu de gouvernance et l'optimisation. Chacun sait qu'aujourd'hui, tout, ou presque, se digitalise. Et demain, nous aurons sans doute accès à des services encore inimaginables il y a quelques années. Alors, quel effet produit cette digitalisation grandissante Pendant que certains se lamentent de la fin des relations chaleureuses entre les êtres humains, embourbés qu'ils sont dans les réseaux sociaux, D'autres s'enthousiasment pour les merveilleuses promesses de l'intelligence artificielle, dont certains pensent pourtant que ce pourrait être la pire des choses de l'histoire de notre civilisation. Et si nous allons un peu plus loin dans l'observation, les choses paraissent claires. Nous sommes en train d'assister simplement à un changement fondamental des rapports entre les êtres humains. Relations dans la sphère privée, changement de relations entre les entreprises et leurs clients, Changement entre les agences du service public et les usagers. Aucun type de relation humaine n'est épargné. Quelle conclusion en tirer, mesdames et messieurs Le piège dans lequel il faut éviter à tout prix de tomber est de croire que le tout numérique réglera toutes les difficultés, créera de l'emploi miraculeusement et permettra une plus grande efficacité des services publics. La ville intelligente, les villes intelligentes dans laquelle vous habitez toutes et tous, ou en tout cas majoritairement, seront celles qui se construiront autour des besoins de leurs habitants, non plus considérées seulement comme des usagers, mais comme des acteurs centraux de leur développement. Ce n'est qu'à cette condition que la véritable, le véritable changement aura lieu, mais il se fera dans la manière dont les êtres humains et les organisations s'empareront de la révolution technologique et numérique et en, forêt, et en feront pardon, un objet de promotion et de développement de la liberté, et pas l'inverse. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I would now like to call upon Under Secretary General Mr. Liu to do the formal opening of the IGF meeting. Thank you. Your Excellencies, as the opening ceremony is going to, to come to an end, in accordance with the customs of the Internet Governance Forum, I now have the honor to invite Her Excellency Ms. Doris Le Tart, President of the Swiss Confederation, to assume the Chair Presidentship of the 2017 IGF on behalf of the Government of Switzerland. Madam, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I thank you, Under Secretary General, for the kind words. And I have the pleasure and also the honor to accept the chairpersonship of this 2017 uh, uh, forum. Hereby, I officially open the forum 2017 here in Geneva. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will now have a musical interlude. <laughs>
Uh, please remain seated while Mr. Muller, Mr. Modo, and Mr. Pagani leave the auditorium.
Thank you very much. Now, let me hand over the moderation of the opening high-level session to Ms. Natalie Ducomo, Deputy Chief Editor of the News Department at the Swiss National Television, RTS, and the remote moderation to Mr. Jovan Kukubiala, Founding Director of Diplo Foundation and Head of the Geneva Internet Platform. Thank you very much, Tai. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor, of course, to be able to moderate today's high-level session. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we're about to discuss one of the most important, challenging, uh, worldwide impacting subjects, the shaping of our future digital global governance. I will please ask our panelists, ladies and gentlemen, following our president, Doris Leuter, to come and join me on stage, please. You will find your names tagged on the chairs. <laughs> Madame la Présidente, je crois que vous êtes au milieu. Please take seat. We will be just discussing uh, the subject not only with our panelists today, but also with you, our audience. We have special guests today in the room. And of course, we have our audience outside the room following us on the internet. Uh, Jovan. Here you are, Jovan, you're going to wave at me. Hi. You are our uh, remote moderator, and you will be following the comments and reaction to the debate from the participants outside, following us on the net. Don't hesitate to let us know what they think and what they have to say about uh, today's subject. We really want to have this panel as interactive as possible. Um, uh, given a chance to everybody to be able to uh, uh, participate, debate, of course, that requires a bit of discipline from us all. That's why I'm going to ask you to be as brief and direct as possible in your intervention. Uh, you know how rude journalists are. I'm a journalist, so I will be interrupting you. Uh, please forgive me for that in advance. But it's, uh, the, the timing, of course, today is uh, tight. As uh, we've heard, digitization provides unique opportunities for innovation, for growth, uh, inclusion, development, but in recent times, the internet has also been associated with growing challenges. Uh, we've mentioned, of course, possible neg negative effects on democracy, um, on human rights, public trust, uh, cyber threats. All this call for a better coordinated global digital governance system. We all agree on that, but how do we achieve it? That, of course, is the question. Well, to launch the debate, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest that each of our panelists uh, give us his main message on the subject, starting, of course, with our chairperson, Mrs. Doris Leutard. Doris Leutard, you're head of the Federal Department of the Environment transport, energy and communication, therefore you are at stakes with uh, uh, the issue concerning digitization of society. Please, what is your vision of the global digital governance in the coming years? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it was told before, confidence, trust in the internet is, is of utmost importance and I think for us as politicians, we see a lot of opportunities. We would like that this helps to, to create new businesses, but for that we must have solutions that we can trust the information which is on social media, on the internet. So trust in the information. 
And in, a, in an era where we have uh, fake news, where we have a lot of uh, uh, also information where we don't know, is it really a, a, a quality information? Uh, is it false? Is it misleading? Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, cyber attacks against governmental bodies as well as uh, 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 companies play in the trust and in internet a role. And if you want to democratize the internet with this access to all and trust for all, I think this is for utmost importance. And that leads me to my second point. We know that billions of objects are being connected. We have uh, uh, new, uh, from self-driving cars to uh, uh, objects to new technologies like blockchain being de deployed on a large scale. Uh, a lot of new developments. And I think, as a politician, at the end of the day, we need a governance structure for all this, because uh, only a certain governance creates stability and predictability. And actually, I would like the internet is, is free, is open, that we need no regulation, but I don't need, we can do it without the governance structure. And that's what I expect from this forum to have some guidance for us as politicians, because I don't, I, I don't understand uh, uh, every detail here. We need, really need experts. Mm -hmm. And if uh, companies or the sector can do it on a self-regulatory way, fine by us. But the governance, I think that's some, uh, something on multilateral level, level, which everybody can rely on, and where also the trust may increase and not be on a lower level. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes, I suppose drawing the line uh, between regulation and, and freedom will be one of the uh, main issues today as well. Uh, Mr. Liu, under Secretary General of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs and UNSG representative, uh, please, what is your vision of the future of global Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Governance. I think that the, the in digital governance or internet governance in the future, first and foremost would be a global governance. Second, should be a rules-based governance. Fourth, should be a, uh, you see, transparent, inclusive governance. Then there should be a, a structured governance. There should be institutions. Of course, I think we, we have been living in the internet world for almost 30 years then we are still lack behind the governance. The governance lack behind the development of technology. In the future, I think we should be living in the interconnected world. I think that for the benefit of the humankind, for the benefit of every human being, we need to enhance the governance. I think this IGF, Intergovernment Forum, provides a good opportunity good platform, because this is a multi-stakeholder platform. I hope that we, we could make good use of this multi-stakeholder IGF to develop some ideas towards the developing the rules for future governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are structure. That's the second time now the word comes in, the governance structure. We'll have to define what that is, of course. Uh, Mr. Hulin Sao. Secretary General of the International Communication Union, ITU. Uh, please give us your vision of uh, how we should shape our digital global governance in the coming years. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. I think that uh, I checked uh, the panelists except the uh, European Commissioner. I, uh, all the others are my friends, you know, for some time, so that I feel <laughs> very comfortable here. And with our president, uh, this year I already met uh, four times at least that uh, in Beijing, one bed, one road uh, forum, and then New York, uh, Children's Assembly of United Nations. Then last time was uh, in UNIRU conference uh, in Vienna. So, You're a big family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was very, uh, no, as president, she has always been invited to speak. And the Secretary General, I will never be invited to speak. You know, that is the <laughs> difference. But anyway, I was very pleased that uh, in whatever you know, uh, occasions, that uh, President never missed opportunity to highlight the importance of ICT and try to support ICT. So that is uh, very much appreciated. Now for me, I think that uh, there is uh, something, if I may, use a very short uh, format, a protocol, that the four eyes. 
The first is is uh, infrastructure. We still need to build up a strong infrastructure to have the, to have new technologies to be uh, used, and also to extend our infrastructure to connect those people not connected yet, to extend the power to those people not really fully profitable of our ICTs. So that the infrastructure is something we need to focus. Then to have a good infrastructure, we need an investment. We don't have enough investment yet. We still have to push for investment. And to have uh, you know, the new development uh, rely on the money only, it's not sufficient. We need the innovation. We need the innovative uh, uh, ways to do our business. And the last I, I would consider is the inclusive, that we have to uh, you know, make uh, ICT beneficial to everybody and not to leave anybody behind. So ITU as a specialized UN agency, of course we are working on the new technologies like 4G, 5G, you know, you know, have a lot of friends you know, very actively engaged with uh, these kind of things. We also take care of uh, capacity building and uh, we focus on connected people, not the connected yet. So this is uh, uh, very, very important. Of course, the President mentioned the confidence to use uh, uh, cyberspace and that is absolutely important and we like mm. to also play uh, active roles and ITU try to invite uh, all the industry members to join us and uh, being safe, you know, that uh, I mentioned in my speech, the Google joined ITU uh, as many new members in 2015, and thanks to your, your support. So we, we like to uh, encourage uh, cooperation, and uh, let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chow. Uh, Mrs. Maria Gabriel, Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society at the European Commission. Um, what is your vision of uh, the coming years, talking about global digital governance. Je vais m'exprimer en français pour quelqu'un qui croit en la valeur de la diversité. Tout d'abord, je voudrais dire qu'en tant que dernière venue dans la famille, je viens avec la force de ma jeunesse, mais je viens aussi avec le respect du travail effectué par mes pères. Et je considère le rendez-vous d'aujourd'hui exactement une occasion de dire, d'une part, nous avons construit beaucoup ensemble. Nous avons réalisé et nous avons eu des succès. Tout ceci parce que ce qui nous réunit, c'est des valeurs. Donc pour moi, l'Internet du futur doit continuer à être un Internet de valeurs. Quelles sont nos valeurs Nous voulons garder un Internet libre, ouvert, un Internet inclusif. Nous voulons en même temps garder une vision optimiste et face au nouveau défi, au nouveau défi d'avoir un Internet plus résilient, plus transparent et plus digne de confiance. Voilà le mot-clé qui est, qui est prononcé. Aujourd'hui, nous devons œuvrer davantage pour que les nouvelles technologies, l'Internet, l'automatisation, soient davantage perçues par les citoyens comme une opportunité et non pas comme une menace. Donc pour cela, je pense qu'il est temps de regarder de plus près la question de la mise en œuvre, de l'application de ces valeurs, de ces politiques et quelle est la responsabilité de nous tous dans cela. Je considère que nous sommes tous responsables du futur de l'Internet. Si on échoue, on échouera tous. Si on réussit, on réussira tous. Et pour cela, je pense que d'une part, l'un des aspects les plus importants, c'est vraiment les compétences numériques. Aujourd'hui, nous devons veiller à ce que les citoyens puissent regarder ce futur de l'Internet avec une confiance qui, elle, viendra de la capacité de bien se servir des différents outils qui sont mis en œuvre. Aujourd'hui, c'est important de se pencher sur les questions de niveau de sécurité des appareils connectés. Aujourd'hui, c'est important aussi de continuer à œuvrer, à développer la pensée critique. C'est elle qui nous permettra de distinguer les fausses nouvelles, de voir la diversité de l'information et de pouvoir continuer à défendre nos valeurs. En même temps, je crois qu'il y a une méthode de travail que nous devons garder et c'est celle-ci. Nous devons continuer à travailler ensemble. Ce n'est qu'en travaillant ensemble que nous pouvons obtenir des résultats. Et pour cela, l'IGF est un point clé. C'est le forum grâce auquel on avance tous. Et je pense qu'il faut continuer dans cette direction-là. Donc un futur qui passe par l'Internet de valeur, un Internet qui est centré sur l'être humain, qui passe par les compétences numériques, un Internet dans lequel il y a de la responsabilité dans la mise en œuvre des principes et des belles déclarations que nous avons si souvent parfois la euh, tendance d'entendre. Après tout, juste une dernière chose. Pour moi, la transformation numérique que nous vivons, elle nous met face à un défi. C'est de garder son visage humain. 
C'est ça ce que nous avons unique. Jamais aucune machine, aucun robot pourra remplacer l'homme dans ce qu'il a d'unique. La créativité, l'innovation, les rapports sociaux. C'est ça qu'il ne faut pas perdre de vue lorsqu'on discute du futur de l'Internet. Merci beaucoup, Gabri Maria Gabrielle. Um, roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders. That is also, uh, of course, a, a key to the discussion, and we'll be talking about it. Mrs. Kathy Brown, uh, you were just about to have a, a sip. Sorry about that. President and Chief Executive Officer of the Internet Society. Uh, you lead the Internet Society in its mission to keep Internet open. We've heard about it and beneficial to all people around the world. Uh, we're talking about these values that you are promoting. What is your vision in the coming years of the global digital governance? So thank you so much and thank you for having us here and um, for all of you being here to think through these very important issues. I think what we hear from uh, folks on the stage and, and through the opening was a commitment to an open, free, globally connected, secure network. But that is not a uh, foregone conclusion. If we listen closely to what Secretary General Mueller just said and the list of things uh, for which he uh, expressed some anxiety, we know that if we do not confront those issues, that we could have a very different future than the one we all want to have. The Internet Society feels some urgency around this issue and some need for us to recommit ourselves to what we say our model is for working through these serious problems. We say our model is a multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary approach to solving these problems, and yet what we see in the world is not that. The folks in this room who are between 18 and 30, and there is a number of them who are here because they know their future depends upon the answers to these questions, will be in charge in 10 years. And they will not be people who grew up without the internet. In fact, they will have grown their whole lives on the internet. As one of the wonderful women who I met this summer uh, when we were in um, uh, Kenya said to me, the internet is our life. If the internet is our life, then governance is about the way we live. And thus governance is on a very local level. It is on a regional level where people live and breathe. And it is on a global level. And to think that we will only talk about internet governance in this space as a global issue is a wrong way to think as the internet goes around the world and changes and evolves. So my view of the future is we have a choice to make. And my call to this assembly is to think about that with some urgency and some clear-eyed notion of what it is we have to do. And that this assembly thinks about where those decisions are being made prepares itself to go and be accepted at those tables and to have a voice in that future. Thank you very much, Mrs. Brown. Mr. Loeb, Eric Loeb, thank you. Senior Vice President, International External and Regulatory Affairs of at and uh, you one of our private sector representatives in the big family today, thank you. Um, what is your vision? of the digital governance in the coming years. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, today, I'm, I'm pleased to speak here and represent the International Chamber of Commerce. The ICC, based in Paris, has representation in 120 countries and is the voice of business, and it has an observer status with the United Nations. There, there are two points that I'd like to share about how it is that we govern within the multi-stakeholder process. And the first one I'd like to get at by honoring the memory of a giant from the private sector who has been a part of the IGF from the beginning and is 
with sadness that we lost Joe Aladef this year, a person who so many people in this room know. And I mentioned Joe out of memory, but also out of respect for how his work embodies the way we want to work together in the multi-stakeholder process, and that is with collegiality and collaboration. It's fact-driven, and it's with empathy as well. It's with an eye to solving problems that are immediate, but not losing sight of the long term and where you need to be. And with all of this, we have to be thinking about the consequential issues. So I think of Joe and I think of all of our work and how we work together across our various interests to achieve progress on shared and important issues. The second issue I want to bring up is something slightly different, but also of how we govern. It is wonderful that we are all here in this room. At the same time, we think about inclusiveness and we talk about inclusiveness all the time, and we are all here with a technology orientation. Yet there is so much that we need to do in the coming years to actually utilize that technology in innovative and strategic ways so that one need not travel halfway around the world and to physically be in the room to have a voice and to have input. So as we work in the coming years, whether it is with virtual reality, with tools of collaboration, we should aspire that for someone who is not here, who can't be here for financial reasons, disability reasons, or you can go down the list, have just as much an impact as participation as it is here. So those are just two initial thoughts on where we should go in the future and how we shall work together. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Loom. Uh, Minister Hassanul Hakinu, Hello, thank you for being with us. You're the Minister of Information of Bangladesh. We would like to hear your vision of the coming years in terms of global uh, governance. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, President Doris Lutard, co-panelist, and the, of course the moderator. Well, uh, we are in the third ICT revolution, but the race for the fourth uh, industrial revolution is on, and the world is parallelly entering the first industrial revolution. But there are certain unfinished tasks uh, and to fill up the gaps, along with other deficits. Not, I want to mention only 3.9 billion mm -hmm. uh, out of 7.5 billion population of the world are offline. Well, uh, I fully agree with the Swiss president. Conference needs to focus on needs of the citizens of the world and digital governance will adapt to their needs. So also I do agree with uh, His Excellency, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who made some words of caution on the misuse of internet. Having said that, uh, I think if you want to shape the future of the digital world, there are certain issues and constraints. Number one, threat of cyber uh, criminals, oblique cyber wars in the cyberspace. Two, lack of digital literacy and capacity in the least developed nations and developing countries. Third, states and peoples of the globe are yet to cope up with the fast developing digitization process. Fourth, lack of digital economy management. Five, management of the internet. So I said, the, so it is our time to shoot the time-worthy pro-people idea arrows with our internet bows. And let us say yes to human rights, no to terrorism and cyber criminals, and denounce engagement of the net system. Having said that, I want to propose four global agreements. Number one, a cyberspace treaty. Number two, a digital economy framework under United Nations format. Third, universal declaration on right to internet as a basic human right by law. Four, multi-stakeholder democratic governance of the internet under UN sanctioned format. I, having said that, I propose seven action plans. Let us connect the unconnected, content development in the mother tongue, remolding of the education system to develop ICT literate citizens. Third, fourth, widened role of the government to develop the infrastructure. Five, 
removal of the transboundary barriers and constants for e-commerce, trade and business. Six, sustainable development compatible digitization to erode social, economic and digital divide. Seven, safe, accessible and affordable internet for all. I hope the conference will look into my four global agreements and seven action <laughs> plans. Thank you very much, Joy Wang. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. We'll surely be talking about inclusive. Um, Mr. Vincent Cerf, hello. Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. Uh, you're an American pioneer, of course, of the internet, so uh, you know where we're coming from. Do you know where we're heading to? <laughs> Let's hear your vision. The simple answer is no. <laughs> In fact, we're headed wherever it is that this organization eventually aims us at. But let me try to imagine that it's December 2027. We'll be sitting here again, and we will still be wrestling with a number of issues. And the reason for that is simple. This system is going to evolve. Mm. It's our use of it. It's the creativity and invention that surrounds it that will cause us to continue to talk about internet and its governance. But I, I'm going to try to make some predictions. There will be at least six billion people online by 2027. There could be more, but some of them may not want to be online. And that might even be our fault if we don't do a good job on the governance front. Second, if the IGF is successful, so I am conditioning everything else here on that, then there will be increased multi-stakeholder collaboration around increased safety, security, reliability, stability, and privacy practices aimed at increasing trust in the internet. There will be more attention to cyber literacy to improve entrepreneurial incentives and capacity for business development and also to assess the quality of content found in the net. We will have a responsibility to do that assessment. No one else can do that for us. There will also be a long-term enhancement of internet infrastructure, especially for rural populations. We will solve that problem. There will be a lot more attention to local content and languages for all the world's users and increased access to the world's public information. And finally, I sincerely hope that there will have been a successful defense against the fragmentation of the Internet. Thank you very much, Mr. Vincent. Mr. Lakshmi Puri, hello. A Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Thank you for being here. Uh, well, you certainly know about coordination and uh, strategic, strategic partnership, sorry, in your position. So what is your vision of how we should all collaborate in the future for a good digital governance? Well, as UN Women, we're very pleased that a woman and president uh, of uh, Switzerland takes over the chairmanship of this forum. And, and, and this is a gender equal panel, almost, is, I think. It is, it uh, is. But as UN women, of course, we look to a future which is led by, participated in, and beneficial equally to women. And we also look to, sh to women shaping that future uh, proactively. And we look to a future where governance enables bridging of the digital divide of women being brought to tech and tech going out to women and the digital revolution delivering for gender equality, women's empowerment, and women's human rights. Because 
that purpose has to be served. And also delivering for the implementation and enabling the implementation of the historic gender equality compact that has been arrived at in the last five years, including, of course, the Beijing Platform for Action, as well as uh, the Agenda 2030 and Goal 5, SDG 5, and we always say high five to that. Mm -hmm. And so the internet world must deliver on particularly 5B, which particularly points to how enabling technology can serve gender equality. So that's, that's very clear. The other aspect that I would like to highlight is uh, harnessing the opportunities. How can governance harness the opportunities, the enormous opportunities that the internet presents for women's empowerment, whether it's education, health, skills, capabilities, jobs, entrepreneurship, uh, you, you look at every aspect, it has a huge force multiplier effect. So that governance must lead to that. And what does that mean? That means in every aspect and tech sector. It means in every development and application because there's, you know, everything, the, the devil and the god is in the detail and, and in application, right? So uh, global, regional, national level, and local level. And it's not enough to mainstream gender equality policies, but it's important to target and visibly prioritize uh, by all stakeholders. And it's also important that government policies uh, and special measures are brought into play and special measures is something I would really like to emphasize. It's not enough to generally pay lip service unless you take special measures, unless you invest in uh, specific targeted policies and, and measures for women and girls to benefit from and participate in uh, internet um, governance and in internet policy, uh, in, in, in the internet itself. Um, we will not be able to really achieve the purpose. Educational and research institutes, civil society, private sector, uh, tech community, content providers, and also multi-stakeholder initiatives. Everybody has been talking about multi-stakeholder governance. And also so, uh, social media engines, and some of, our, uh, some of them are now equally participating with us in um, uh, some of the initiatives for norm change, social and cultural norm change, which is so crucial for gender equality. And that's a very important opportunity as well. It can be a threat. So we have to also use that. On the other side, if I may, this is my last point. Uh, on the other side, I think it's equally important that e-governance initiatives uh, really reach and involve women and target women and girls. So that's something that's the other side of governance. And as I said, our dream, our vision is a planet 50-50 where there is internet 50-50, digital revolution 50-50. Thank you. Seeking for equality. Thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Mr. Masahiko Tominaga, uh, Vice Minister for Policy Coordination at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication of Japan. Thank you for being here. Um, we, we're just, we were just mentioning the importance of governance. Uh, what is your vision of the future? Thank you, coordinator. Development of the internet and the rapid release of the digital revolution has been Far, behind, far beyond any of our imaginations. The influence of the internet age is reaching every corner of society and the economy. The magnitude of the internet effect surpasses the encompassing experience of human existence, well beyond anything encountered during the previous revolutions. Digital governance up until now has been falling behind the rapid changes spread along 
by the ever advancing technologies. Keeping in mind the tremendous potential influence on civic life, society, and the economy, I believe it is important to share a desirable vision for the future digitization and the basic principles of digital governance for, realize, for realizing that vision with different stakeholders. And also important is to facilitate proactive discussion on a necessary roadmap for working together toward better digital governance. As we build up digital infrastructure and introduce digital technologies to achieve global digital connection, connectivity, differences in governance and management of the cyberspace by countries and regions can lead to the decline of the benefits of digital technologies, drastically leading to disruption of the cyberspace. I believe it is critically important to promote worldwide coordination. In other words, harmonization of digital governance to, to maximize the benefits of digitization for everyone. I also believe when harmonization of digital governance broadens globally, the benefits from digitization will grow much bigger. As we all know, digitization has been developed by participation and contribution by various stakeholders. And I strongly believe this multi-stakeholder participation must be continued. However, we know in the physical world we live in that the sole participation of multi-stakeholders will not guarantee sound and sustainable development of digital world. Action and role taking by stakeholders is required for harmonization of digital governance. I believe one of the most essential technologies in the digital world is artificial intelligence or AI. And I am promoting proactive global discussion on AI based on the ideas I have mentioned today. The Organization of, for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, is taking a leading role internationally concerning the discussion of various aspects of AI and is holding a workshop during this Internet Governance Forum. I am supporting its initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tominaga. Uh, let's go to you. Henriette Esterhusen, you're Director of Global Policy and Strategy uh, for the Association for Progressive Communications, the APC, that's an international network of organization, working to support social justice and development. Uh, we're talking again about some of uh, shared values here. Um, what is your vision of the future of the governance of internet? Um. My, my vision, um, if it's based on what is happening at the moment, would be a very dark vision. Um, and I do hope that we can, can divert from that. Um, to do that, I think we have to acknowledge that, that much of what we think and say about the internet and internet governance is based on a fantasy. Maybe the fantasy, but not just the fantasy in a negative sense. I think the hopes and dreams of the early innovators, the people who built and created the created the internet as a space where you can be yourself, where if you're a minority, a sexual minority or a cultural minority or someone who's politically oppressed, you can express and tell your story and, and gain solidarity and support, and where you can gain knowledge, where you can gain economic opportunity. And in fact, I think what is happening is that the internet in many senses is really just reflecting the world as it is, which is a world full of inequality full of violence um, and, and disruption. Um, I think for us to, to take some sense of control as a community and to, to change this trajectory, we need to acknowledge that it's not so much the network that we don't trust, it's one another that we don't trust. Users can't trust corporations to deal with their data responsibility. 
and we can't trust governments to not disrupt the internet and shut it down in many parts of the world. We can't trust that we are not being surveyed, that journalists are not being targeted by the regimes who don't like what they say. So to, to, to change that, I think we need a, a governance framework that's based on principles, that based, is based on some norms, norms that respect the technical integrity, um, the core, the publicness of the internet, and that, are, um, that abide with, with, with human rights, and that also tackle some of the social challenges, um, such as gender inequality. I think we're at a point where openness on its own and also implies openness to abuse, openness to, to exploitation, openness to, to, um, to breaking the, the, the power of the internet to be a force for good. Um, I also think we need norms that look at competition and innovation, um, 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 access to entry. So, so also norms and rules that ensure that from a market perspective, the internet is a more open space than it is becoming at the moment. So that, I think, is actually the really tough challenge, that we, that we want openness, but we need to look at what form of engagement, regulation, partnership between, between different stakeholders, public sector and private sector, um, is needed to really protect that openness. Thank you very much. Uh, Vincent, you wanted to react. Well, I want to thank Henriette for uh making a very, very clear observation. I'm going to amplify it by making the following, uh, offering you the following notion. The internet today and the World Wide Web is a reflection of the world we live in. We can't run away from that, and if you try to change what's in the mirror, nothing happens. You have to change what's reflected in it. Let's use the internet and its reflection to tell us about our society and how it needs to change. And I think that is the call that uh, Andrea puts on the table, and I support that. But should we use some uh, regulations, some laws, some very official uh, policies to aim to that, to, to, you know, to, to reach that purpose? I'm not sure that you can pass a law that changes human behavior. I mm. think we have to get humans to want to change. You can threaten them. You can say, if we catch you doing this, there will be consequences. But in the end, we have to want to make the society we want to live in. Making the rules and enforcing them doesn't necessarily create the society that we want. But we can understand on the governments, for, you know, people representing governments, you've, you're probably thinking, you know, at least if I had a set of uh, rules that I could apply uh, to, to sanction things when they're not going well and to respect all these values, that would be helpful. Doris Leutard. Well, well, I think a lot of laws we have for, uh, today, civil laws are also apli applicable to mm -hmm. cyber. And I think we just must uh, adapt it and uh, also say to the public when, when you're, you're uh, as a criminal initiative is the same if you do it on the ground and in cyber territory. So we must also uh, say this clearly. We don't need to have a new uh, uh, penalty law. Actually, the civil laws of today are mostly applicable also uh, mm -hmm. to the cyberspace. I think I would come back to the, and thank the Minister from Bangladesh for, for his very concrete proposals. And well, we can uh, for hours talk about inequality and I think what he said is quite right. First of all, we must have infrastructure in all mm -hmm. countries. And infrastructure, high broadband infrastructure. Uh, so here I think that's something governments have to do and the private sector has to do. And you here, mean creating new infrastructures. Yeah, creating yeah. Mm -hmm. high road band mm -hmm. infrastructure and, and, and also what was uh, told illiteracy or basic knowledge about, about the internet and all our uh, uh, relevant technologies. I think here that's something governments have to do. And we, as developed countries here, we, can, we have to change our 
classical cooperation uh, on development, but because so far we concentrated on, let's say, uh, old infrastructure, and I think now we must think, uh, well, per perhaps it's better to offer for some years uh, free Wi-Fi for all. Perhaps mm. this is much more helpful than uh, investing in new bridges and roads and so on. I think uh, here I made some experiences with, for example, a project with the president of Rwanda. Here, together with, uh, with others, we uh, uh, supported the initiative Free Wi-Fi for All. And the effect was much more uh, 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 in favor of the population having access to the internet, having also affordable uh, uh, conditions, because an investor, when you have commercial rates, you will never uh, get internet for all. And I think here we must learn what is uh, uh, from politicians, from governments, from yeah. private sector, uh, uh, something we have to do. And then the, 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 the laws we have apply in this new world. Mm -hmm. And when there is still something needed, the, this forum can help us to say what structure uh, in the governance is needed, the rules of law, well, that's clear for everybody, human rights, that's also clear for everybody. So mm. what remains uh, in the governance structure, this we have to do here. Yeah, thank you very much. If you've been asking for uh, the mic, Mrs. Brown? No, Mrs. Puri. Would you just hand out? You wanted to react. No, I wanted to... Um react in, in fact to what the president said very rightly, that it is crucial that infra basic infrastructure is universally available. If you just look at women's access, uh, out of uh, the 3.9 you mentioned, billion, billion that were unconnected, um, nearly two billion are women. So how do we make available the uh, connectivity? How do we create enhanced digital literacy, access to finance and payment systems, sound legal and regulatory frameworks, I think everybody has talked about, Digital education for all, I think I entirely agree with the minister's uh, recommendations. And how do you bridge the higher education to uh, employment gap? You know, this whole issue of how is the internet contributing to jobs mm -hmm. crisis or is it contributing to a solution to the jobs crisis? I think that's a very important issue in terms of policies, role and responsibilities. And um, uh, also it's about, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of dealing with e-government. Uh, you know, how can, and, and in our context, of course, we very much want women to be co-designing, co-delivering uh, uh, e-governance uh, uh, services. And, and of course, it is incumbent on all actors mm. to really take on these responsibilities on access, connectivity, enabling uh, the use mm -hmm. of the internet and also the impact. It's a question of uh, willpower <laughs> for every country to decide what they want uh, for, for population. Well, you wanted to react, uh, Excellency. Uh, uh, let me uh, tell you about an experience of Bangladesh. Uh, under the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina for the last nine years, the poverty e, e, re, re, ratio dropped to 24% from 40%. So it is uh, what I uh, want to substantiate uh, with the His Excellency Madam President, that the government should come up with wider roles to develop and invest in infrastructure and other things. We in Bangladesh, to re reduce the digital gap, in our secondary schools, mostly in the villages, more than 22,000 secondary schools have been given free computer laboratory. That is very important uh, to reduce yeah. Now at the moment, out of 160 million people, 130 million people are using mobiles. 80 million are internet users for the last four years. That is a dramatic rise. So I want to say that here, the right to internet, what I did say, 
should be by law a universal declaration should be in mm-hmm. part of the constitution and you state, say it's a human right don't you yes internet so is a human internet, right internet internet mm-hmm. right and i want to say that well uh, bangladesh is a showcase bangladesh mm-hmm. is a showcase mm-hmm. of why the government is investing we are not living into the so called free market economy mm-hmm. where government is investing in digitization of the whole process especially in developing infrastructure in all these sub districts we have internet uh, 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 hub mm-hmm. so the people who doesn't have a laptop can go to the uh, nearest uh, uh, cyber center within 2 kilometers and talk to the a mother father whatever inside and outside mm-hmm. can uh, record uh, whatever they want to do is the private sector collaborating no uh, uh, yes the private sector is collaborating we have the mobile companies the uh, foreign mobile need companies the investment, of course. they are investing in mm-hmm. a huge and they are uh, they are responsible for this huge uh, mobile network expansion we have 100% mobile coverage and internet coverage in the country mm-hmm. so private sector is in but investing in optical fiber connections mm-hmm. that is where uh, the private sector is not coming the government needs to invest in the infrastructure in the infrastructure that is how you uh, reduce the digital gap the mm-hmm. point point is the future is a digital world so will the future digital world will widen the digital gap or reduce the digital gap so mm-hmm. i said about the constants mm-hmm. so if we do not address the constants and issues then definitely the digitization of the whole world will definitely create a glass house but in that glass house there will be so many uncontented people living here mm-hmm. but uh, about the democracy a uh, what the uh, uh, old friend has said democracy is nothing but rule of law to me democracy is like a mosquito net you sit within the net mm-hmm. and look outside and breathe openly but no mosquito is coming inside and outside mm-hmm. so you need to take care of the cyber crime so we need to develop a global global agreement on cyber space mm-hmm. cyber treaty mm-hmm. and bangladesh is drafting has drafted a cyber crime act which will be placed in the parliament in january so i say well we'll we need sorry. laws to deter criminal activities to keep safe the cyber space mind that the digitization creates a glass house where everything can be seen but in the glass house the children are there women are there we need to protect the children dignity of the women and the state machinery is there the institutions are there but so yeah. we there there comes the technical solutions and the legal solutions but the glass house will be on nobody mm-hmm, can check it mm-hmm. but you supporting uh, laws application on your regional i mean in your country oh, sorry i mean the laws you, you asking for new laws uh, to o- tackle o- cyber threats notably o- already already bangladesh has drafted a laws for last two years we have been discussing with all the stakeholders by keeping human rights intact mm-hmm. it is possible to draft a digital security act which will deter the cyber criminals well that's the kind of issue the european commission also has to deal with i suppose uh would you want it to react maria gabriel je vais commencer en disant qu'effectivement une loi ne peut pas changer le comportement humain mm-hmm. en revanche je crois qu'il faut prendre un peu plus de temps pour s'arrêter se dire à quel niveau quelle est l'approche qui donnera le plus de résultats. Et c'est là où on s'aperçoit qu'au niveau institutionnel, il y a des règlements, des lois qui sont ceux qui assurent la sécurité juridique, la prévisibilité, la durabilité, y compris lorsqu'on parle d'investissement, parce que c'est ça qu'on veut. De même, il y a aussi des initiatives législatives qui doivent servir juste de catalysateur. Nous ne pouvons pas nous substituer à l'initiative privée, à la société civile, à la force de raisonnement et de l'initiative individuelle. Mm-hmm. En revanche, nous pouvons servir de ce type de catalysateur avec, je donnerai les deux exemples, Wi-Fi for EU, un projet pilote que la Commission européenne va lancer au mois de février. Entre 6 et 8 000 communes en Europe vont recevoir cet accès gratuit à l'Internet à des endroits publics. 
Effectivement, nous nous réjouissons si on obtiendra le soutien des États membres de nos partenaires internationaux, si cette initiative pourrait s'élargir à un maximum d'endroits au monde. Une autre initiative, c'est la Digital Opportunity Scheme. On, veut, on parle tous de la nécessité d'avoir des gens qui sont compétents, des gens qui, doivent et qui peuvent acquérir ces compétences, offrir la possibilité à des étudiants qui ne sont pas IT spécialistes de venir, de voir qu'est-ce que c'est le blockchain, qu'est-ce que c'est la technologie quantique, mm -hmm. Le web design, ça c'est une possibilité. Le budget est seulement 10 millions d'euros pour le Digital Opportunity, 120 millions d'euros pour la Wi-Fi for EU. Nous sommes parfaitement conscients que ce n'est pas ça qui va changer la donne fondamentale, mais elle peut être un catalyseur de changement. Et je pense que de temps en temps, c'est ça aussi qu'on attend des autorités publiques, d'avoir cette force de dire par le biais de la loi que la sécurité, la prévisibilité, la durabilité, elle passe aussi par ce type d'initiative. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Katie Brown, you wanted, you wanted to react as well on that point. So I want to agree that through the enlightenment of many governments of the world, we've made great progress in access. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of the infrastructure, we have made progress in the last 10 years. So this notion that we would all have access to the digital world is starting, although I think minister says quite clearly there's still a third of the world not there so let's not forget that but the issue becomes once we live in the digital world how do we govern ourselves where we have a world that is borderless we can reach anywhere in the world mm -hmm. when we are on the internet and thus the issues we have to face are very different And the concern that we have is that the tools in a, in a world that is rapidly changing and where the acceleration of change is, is, is increasing every day. So it's not just that change is fast, it's that the acceleration of change mm. is fast. That we are not equipped to uh, adjust and to incorporate the needs of the various stakeholders, the voices, the, the aspirations of those stakeholders, that governments tend to be slow on purpose, deliberative, they say, and yet we live in a world that uh, decisions need to be made, and they need to be made across borders, and they need to be made in ways that we never had to before. The hack that just took the, um, the identities of, of the, um, the uh, credit agency didn't happen in the jurisdiction of the local police. It didn't. So wh where was that and how was that? And how can we start to think mm. differently about that? Part of what we say when we're talking about multi-stakeholder uh, participation, multi-stakeholder engagement, is that there shouldn't be just a simple consultation. Uh, we've got you, you put your paper in, thank you very much but that working through those problems that are significant problems requires a different kind of decision making that is collaborative in nature. So while as I listen to everyone, I actually agree with those outcomes. I don't disagree with those outcomes. The question is how are we gonna get there in an inclusive way so that those who need to under, have a point of view that is not one that is readily understood by various folks have the opportunity to present it, have the opportunity to be involved in the actual decision making. So to the extent that we all agree on what the outcomes will be, I'm not sure that we A, agree on the processes because mm -hmm. the processes have remained the same. Through these 20 years, the, the government that I served is doing things the exact same way they did 20 years ago. The exact same way. Meaning? Nothing has one, changed. One, concrete, one example. Pieces of paper are put in by people who call themselves, um, you know, a part, they, they are parties to the proceeding and the parties to the proceeding can put the paper mm -hmm. in and the, the, the agency goes off and behind closed doors makes a decision gives an order, it goes to court, and we do this nonsense, in my view. Instead of sitting down, trying to figure out a problem where we get a consensus view so that it's a sustainable, ongoing decision that is made that can indeed give us some normative behavior. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Sister Houston on the uh, decision-making, the process of decision-making. I, I agree with, with um, um, 
Cathy's um, input. I think we do need to constantly interrogate how we um, make these decisions, how we come to solving these problems. And I think the IJF remains a really powerful platform to, to help us reflect, reflect critically on our own processes, on multi-stakeholder processes, and on policy-making processes um, more broadly. I do not think we need new law, so I agree absolutely. I think mm. the rule of law um, is a very powerful tool, and many people, if not most in the world, don't have access to it. So what we need to do is to, is to make sure that they do, and that those laws that we do have, and those inter international rights that we do have um, um, are adhered to. I think what's challenging, Cathy talked about the cross-border nature, mm. um, that makes the decision-making process difficult. Um, difficult. It makes the accountability also very difficult. And I think that's something that as a community we need to look at more. How do we hold um, actors um, uh, who, who violate what we aspire the internet to be and who violate existing rights and obligations, how do we hold them accountable um, in this um, um, cross-border um, context? And just a, a comment on cybersecurity. I think cybersecurity legislation is a, is a good example because it's usually made at the national level, but it also requires collaboration adherence to global and standards and tools <laughs> as well. But it's also unfortunately often become a vehicle where states are introducing regulation that, for example, criminalizes certain forms of speech, which is not internet specific. So um, it's also um, a risk, but a very good opportunity for us to change how we make policy and to ensure that it's done collaboratively and respectful of rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I think our president has to leave the panel, I have been told. So please remain seated and uh, we'll let you just uh, leave stage. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Leutard, president of the Swiss Confederation. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, uh, Eric Loeb was asking for the mic. Thanks Please. so much. Well, I just want to make a point and come back to some of the challenges that we're facing and to reflect on something Vint had said before about fragmentation. You know, uh, many of the challenges that we've been talking about are, are shortcomings in our aspirations. Uh, inclusion, connecting the unconnected, closing the gender divide. The point I want to make about fragmentation is it's a risk of regression and one that, when playing out, impedes progress on those aspirational areas. And I just think about that, perhaps we take stock of 20 years since 1997 with the WTO GATS, which triggered so much market opening and access. There was a wave of, uh, of, of, of access and connectivity that really has drawn together the internet as we know it. And my observation as I work in countries all over the world, our regions, is there are many places where it's either getting harder to participate in the first place or you're having to exit. And so this point of fragmentation is important to highlight for its risk of achieving the other issues that we want to make progress on. Thank you very much, Mr. Loeb. I, I will go back to you. I just would like to uh, ask uh, Jovan to join in because he's been making some signs and we did promise we would have an interactive uh, debate with our audience. So let's go to you, uh, Jovan. We're going to switch your mic on. There. Yeah. Okay. It's yep. fine. Thank you. On behalf of the uh, online community and uh, remote participants, but I noticed some of them were tweeting here from the room, therefore they are using the back <laughs> channel to uh, send the messages. There are a few trends in this discussion. Wind's uh, metaphor, as always, on the mirror uh, triggered quite a few comments uh, with the two trends uh, about the uh, difference between online and offline world, uh, and then the question, can law change our behavior? It cannot change, but it can influence. 
and we need a law since Hammurabi's uh, uh, time uh, till today. That was, that was one line about uh, change, uh, change influence. The, then we had interesting discussion on values, uh, which was brought by commissioner, and it also uh, reflected uh, strongly in the comments. The question of urgency, that, which uh, Cathy Brown uh, brought, and the question of context, local context, and few comments on the tweet where the context is uh, not related to residents, then there was a question, who is missing here today? And there were two groups which are missing. People who are not connected, yep. their lives are influenced, but they are not connected, and uh, future generations, how we can protect the interests of future generations. Then there were m quite a few more specific uh, comments which we'll summarize in the newsletter for tomorrow, but I know we are running out of time, therefore I'll pass the floor back. Thank you very much, uh, Jovan. We, we have some questions uh, in the audience too, so let's take a, a, a few remarks. Sir, I can see you. Just press on your mic and we should organize sound. Just wait for it to, you, you have to wait for the red light once you've pressed the button. Yeah. Harid Prime from the Gulf Center for Human Rights. Uh, your distinguished speaker mentioned the need for an open and free internet, which are the uh, main principles of network neutrality. Now, this is lacking in our region, the MENA mm -hmm. region and other regions. The question, like uh, IGF after IGF, it's getting worse over there. So. Is there uh, an initiative uh, by the uh, international uh, uh, institutions to support online activists and to enhance the protection of uh, freedom of expression on the net in our region? Is there a real initiative to support civil societies that are facing governments that almost fully uh, on the internet in our countries, this is really v very much uh, a need that without mm -hmm. it, we are not going to uh, make any change. And I have a small comment on behalf of the voiceless, those colleagues who didn't make it to Switzerland because of the complication of the visa. A thank to the Swiss government for hosting this IGF, but they said, my colleagues, kindly next time hold the IGF in an open, a more open and accessible country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to uh, answer? Mr. Mr. Chow? About the uh, oh, please, on, on the online uh, freedom of speech. Yes. Well, from Bangladesh point of view, let me answer this question like that. The Bangladesh constitution do guarantee basic human rights and freedom of speech. We have a special clause at the same time Bangladesh government for the last eight years has opened up the broadcasting network. We have developed community radio, FM radio in the private sector. So many television licenses given to the private sector. Recently, more than 2,000 online news portals are active, and we have allowed that. But that doesn't restrict uh, freedom of writing and speech. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my ministry has drafted a law on broadcast, broadcast law, and we are going to set up a broadcast commission that will not be in conflict with the basic right to speech and association. So we can balance, it is a fine act of balancing, balancing of human rights with uh, the freedom of speech. That can be possible, uh, so we can share experiences across the world, and I Personally, as a minister, I will say that I am for freedom of speech totally. Thank no you. problem. I was a fighter. Okay. Mr. Chow, Mr. please, on the freedom of speech and the protection of civil no, no, society. Let me just uh, answer those two questions. Yes. For example, please. you know, uh, Johan mentioned that uh, for those, uh, you know, uh, future generations, I think that is absolutely <laughs> important question for us. And uh, we consider that the SME, for example, from a young generation, the very dynamic in the SME, so that they have... Uh, very, very big uh, power of innovation, and they have uh, also good understanding of their local market. They want to do something, and I think that we have to work with them. And last year, actually, I was in Dhaka to, to join the authority to open their first uh, uh, innovation center, you know, that uh, national innovation center. So that everywhere in the developing country, you see the young people from high-tech park, uh, from, 
from uh, uh, innovation center very very brilliant. So that we have to to to, to try to in integrate their power into our business. And secondly, for the those not connected yet, I think I already mentioned that in my speech. And uh, Ving mm -hmm. also mentioned that uh, he believes by 2027 we will have uh, six millions uh, online. Mm -hmm. so that is, I think, that uh, possible. And uh, IIT has. Uh, I already set up uh, the target by 2020, we should have next uh, 1.5 billion people connected online, which means from 4 to 4, 5.5. So that uh, from 2020 to 2027, another, uh, that should be all right. But anyhow, the problem is, the problem is, we, we talked about this uh, uh, connection of 1.5 billion online. Someone calculated that we need at least 450 billion US dollars and then we don't have this money. And then we went to World Bank. World Bank did not put this money aside. Mm. And this kind of things to, to the industry, they consider you're joking, Mr. Zhao. 450 billion only to connect the next 1.5 billion people. Yeah. And those like in the, in the villages, they need not only the internet infrastructure, but also energy to, to support this. So that is quite a challenge. But anyhow, I think that if we have good policy, that should be possible. You know, one good example is Myanmar. 2011, they only had 5.0% uh, of uh, mobile penetration by the end of 2011. Mm -hmm. Then they tried to, to change that uh, to 50% by the year of 2015. So I told them, I was there, that if you open your market, it should be easy. And in fact, by 2015, they already reached 67%. So this kind of thing, so that is, uh, I think that uh, the good environment could attract the investment, then it should be possible to, to mm. get that. But anyhow, here there is a misperception that the ICT is always a profit-making business and a self-sustainable. You don't need to care too much about that. I think this is not 100% true. And the industry like uh, at and mm -hmm. Eric, he is under very heavy competitions. And if anything wrong, he could be bankrupt tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of giant bankrupt today. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, something we really have to create a good environment to encourage investment, to encourage the business people to, 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 to mm -hmm. find uh, the good opportunity to come to those areas, help us to connect people not connected yet. So that's, uh, we also work with, uh, with uh, other partners, for, for example, ICT for gender balance, is that uh, I too designate a special day last uh, Thursday of uh, April of uh, uh, every year, that uh, for ICD for women and girls, we are very mm -hmm. pleased to have already 160 countries mobilized. And we worked with young women to have this new project uh, equals. So tomorrow we will have a program and it's sponsored by Cathy, you know, that uh, we, we were grateful for her, for her sponsorship. <laughs> we'll be following but, uh, that closely. But, but there's still Thank you. alarming signal. I was in one of the African countries uh, uh, this year that uh, the university, it's my hobby to visit the university, mm -hmm. The 80,000 students, over the last decade, there is no single women student for mathematics. So that, that is, uh, mm -hmm. is a warning, so that we still have to work hard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's hear from our, our guests here uh, in, uh, in the room. Mr. Rashid Ismailov, thank you for being with us, Deputy Minister of uh, Telecom and Mass Communication of the Russian Federation. We'd like to hear you. Uh, what is the comment you'd like to throw in um, concerning the debate? Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Um, the question was about how do you see uh, the world, the digital world in ten, 10 years. But I would like to take you back maybe two revolutions before to the industrial one. It started in England, as you remember, with the enclosures so that eventually people were telling, saying that the ships ate the man. Now, I mean, each revolution has a side effect. And... Uh, I believe that this one, the fourth one, will also have it. Considering that we haven't realized, comprehended the results of the third one of the information revolution, and we're now already going into the fourth one after, and the world is accelerating, I mean. After the 30 years of the, of the information revolution, we're already in the fourth. Now, considering all these side effects and having in mind that the basement and the platform for the fourth uh, digital revolution will be internet, we in Russia are very much concerned about the internet governance issues because even here, I mean, in this uh, audience, uh, 
there were a lot of uh, kind of uh, cautious, the brave new world prophecies, how it will look like. Will it, uh, you know, increase the digital divide between the developing countries and the developed countries? Now, there are a lot of issues. And one of the main issues for our business, for example, is how to invest, where, whether the rules for the investments are existing or not. Because, I mean, it will require, the digital shift will require a huge number of uh, investments and resources. I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking only. I mean, we are talking about, uh, you know, education, uh, preparation of, of the competencies of the uh, resources for to handle this uh, revolution and so far and so forth uh, we're talking about health social kind of impacts that this digital revolution will have eventually uh, we in Russia have started at least and I believe most of the developed countries already started with the programs there's a program which is called you know uh, Industrial 4.0 in Germany and, and in, in Japan, in US, most of the developed countries are, do have already their programs. Now, there's a discussion how to unite them, how to match one to another, and this discussion take, has taken place in, uh, uh, in G20 and in some other venues. We believe that since internet and digital issues are so universal with the impact to every aspect of uh, humanity that uh, the best platform for the discussion of these issues should be UNO, at least one international platform where the rules and forms should be developed for all, for business, for society, for countries, so that in 10 years we will not suffer from the side effects that, uh, that any revolution has. Believe me, I'm Russian, and we know what revolution is and the consequences, no matter what eventually happened with the results of the revolution. So based on that, we think that uh, several issues should be addressed to the UN level and discussed. First, uh, the regulatory issues. Second, uh, the technological and research and development issues that, so that we shouldn't waste the resource of the, of the world, actually, to this kind of stuff. The third one is considering the infrastructure. I mean, in order to to, in order to actually uh, see the result, the fruits of the revolution, you need to have an access to the services that the, this revolution will provide. For our country, the biggest challenge is territory, and for us, uh, the infrastructure uh, means a lot. Now, the fourth one is the issues regarding the uh, international security, uh, information security. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, 50 years ago, the internet was invented by, uh, you know, creative engineers and scientists. And uh, I know, I mean, we can ask Windsor maybe, but even himself, he didn't predict that, uh, he didn't predict what will eventually it will look like. Uh, now the stakes uh, that we have are, are immense. They will touch upon uh, and everybody. That means that we have to discuss all these uh, consequences and issues on the very high level and so far we don't see any other place rather than United Nations organization. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Maismailov. I'd, I'd like uh, some reaction to that, uh, the question of, of uh, having uh, the UN level uh, engaged. Uh, probably uh, from you, Goran Marbi, from ICANN, CEO of ICANN. Thank you for being here. Uh, we often say that a big institution, big infrastructure like the UN is, is, can't be efficient enough in terms of following up the development of technology and the changes um, of, of lives, really. What is your opinion about um, Mr. Ismailov's statement? 
First of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give this short. Um, I'm very happy to be here in Geneva at IGF. The simple answer to it is that we have excellent relationship with the UN system. Um, we had Sherman Sao coming down to our meeting in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we have several interconnection points with the UN system. And we're very proud and very happy about it. Um, but I, I think that to take a step back, um, to talk about, there's many questions about the multi-stakeholder model. During the last 25 years, the internet is among, or if not, the fastest growing technology ever. And that is based on that users, people, saw the benefit of coming into this global network. During those 25 years, the multi-stakeholder model has supported this. And it's very much thanks to the multi-stakeholder model that this exists. We've been able to sort out issues that no one in mankind ever have seen before, because no one before have seen the effects of connecting people. ICANN, which is one of the partners, the technical partners to provide this service, is very proud to be a part of it. And we do exist to provide this service to the world. But we are at a critical junction when it comes to the future of digital global governance. I believe that the very it's important to have a diverse and constructive particip participation in meetings like this. Because internet, as some people already have mentioned today, hits every part of your life. It is, has gone from just information sharing that you today do a lot of your work, your life, even your love life, on the internet. And therefore, I think it's important that anyone would have a say in internet governance. In ICANN, we bring together governments, science, education, civil society, and businesses into one multi-stakeholder model. And that is because no one should control domain name systems, no one should take control, and no one should manage it without the multi-stakeholder model. And this is also important for the next billion users, or one and a half billion users. They're going to be very different from us. I claim that the current model has produced a lot of good results, but often for the elite. People with money, people who live in the cities, people who can understand, for instance, English as a concept to read from left to right, or with a dot in the middle. We have to improve ourselves and do better so we can make sure that the next billion users, which will be primarily mobile, can use their own local languages, their own scripts, in a better way. Because that's the one we need to reach. The fundamental understanding is that by connecting people on one global network, something magical happens. It's something we should never forget. And I look forward to work with everybody in this room, with everybody here, to make sure we can shape this future together in a diverse and multi-stakeholder way. With that, I would like to thank everybody who's created the first three to four billion users of the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marby. Uh, sat next to you, we also have uh, Mrs. Farida Dwi-Kayarini, uh, your Secretary General of the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology of Indonesia. Indonesia, um, what do you have to say about uh, the shaping of our, of our future global uh, governance? Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, in our opinion, in Indonesia, by 20, 2020, Indonesia is targeting to reach 130 billion US dollar from e-commerce transaction. In this, the vision of Indonesia and the digital energy of Asia. To achieve this, Indonesia is completing the internet infrastructure through the Palapari program to pursue in target in 2019. Palapari is telecommunication infrastructure project in the form of fiber optic construction throughout Indonesia along the 36 million uh, kilometers connecting several major islands in Indonesia to reach 440 cities or district. In our addition, we keep facilitating several strategies program to encourage small medium enterprises go online and to develop more digital startup. 
We also realize that the internet also bring negative impact that Indonesia also suffer from it, especially caused by the spread of illegal content such as hoax and hate speeches. Therefore, we does on not only action in the downstream by enforcing the law or terminating the access to the illegal content, but also instead the government of Indonesia priorities the national digital literacy movement called cyber creation, a multi-stakeholder synergistic action as the upstreaming sites. We are continuously working to improve the mechanism of internet governments, governance with the spirit of multi-stakeholder. One of the efforts is by running a number of dialogue through Indonesia Internet Government Program, we call IDIGF, which has been introduced in 2002 and has hosted IGF Global in Bali in 2013. And last month, we just conducted our annual IGF Dialogue 2000. 17, followed by almost 100 partici 500 participants from various stakeholders. Finally, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to all parties for the preparation of the IGF 2017. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, Jovan, I think we have, uh, do we have a special guest by video? Special guest, uh, Brad Smith, the president of uh, Microsoft, he is going to deliver video message. I guess it is ready. Hello, I'm Brad Smith, president of Microsoft. I'm thrilled to speak with you today. The Internet Governance Forum is an ideal opportunity for stakeholders from around the world to discuss the important policy issues posed by the digital transformation taking place around us. And I can't think of a better place to have this discussion than Geneva, a city I had the pleasure of visiting just last month. As all of you know well, it doesn't matter where on the planet you come from. We all live in a digital world whether it's how we work, create, communicate, or entertain ourselves, digital technology has become a cornerstone of our lives. And that raises fundamental questions for all of us. For example, how do we protect the digital world that we all rely on from hackers and nation state attacks? How do we ensure that the benefits of digital transformation are realized in every corner of the world? And how do we ensure that everyone no matter their circumstances or ability, can take part in the digital economy. At Microsoft, we appreciate that we have a responsibility in helping to address all of these issues. That's why we've called for the tech sector, governments, and civil society to come together to establish a digital Geneva Convention for the 21st century, a convention that builds upon existing international law to keep the world safe not just from attacks on machines, but attacks on vital infrastructure, which left unchecked, will only grow in severity. It's also why we launched our airband initiative in the United States, which we will expand globally to ensure that those without access to broadband can get broadband access and can realize the benefits and opportunities of the digital economy. And it's why we're so deeply committed to expanding digital skills education around the world to ensure that everyone, no matter where they live or their current circumstances, can acquire the skills they need to thrive in the digital economy. If the United Nations is to realize its 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, all of us need to play an important role. As technology's role continues to grow, we at Microsoft are committed to partnering with stakeholders from around the world to ensure that we build a cloud for global good that empowers us all. Thank you. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, we can applause, of course, Brad Smith. Thank you, Jovan. Let's probably have the reaction from a few of our panelists before we go back to the audience on the uh, proposal, the solution that is uh, being stated here by, uh, by Brad Smith, a un you know, uh, international convention, uh, which could respond to a few of uh, the worries that we, we heard earlier on. Um, probably Maria Gabrielle as the... Commission, European Commission, what would you think of uh, an international convention? Comme je l'avais dit déjà, je crois que nous avons besoin aujourd'hui de plus de coopération. Ici, une telle convention pourra permettre, dans un contexte où nous sommes tous conscients quels sont les défis, mm -hmm. de clairement dire que nous avons tous des responsabilités, ça pourra permettre d'accélérer le processus. Mais pour cela, Il faudrait de la volonté de tous. Il faudrait aussi mm -hmm. qu'on s'assure qu'on regarde dans la même direction et qu'on est de nouveau passé, qu'on est de nouveau basé sur des valeurs et des principes. Aucune vision d'avenir ne pourra pas tenir si derrière nous n'avons pas cette base solide mm -hmm. qui dit nous avons réalisé grâce à cette volonté commune qui aujourd'hui nous a réunis et nous voulons réussir et, de, et obtenir davantage avec de nouvelles responsabilités, avec une meilleure prise, en, prise de conscience des nouveaux défis. Thank you. Well, it seemed to me, actually, that they, you, ha you had quite a lot of values in common. Uh, you know, that you, you, it's, it's rather the mean is how to uh, apply and get together to uh, m making decisions and uh, deciding on policies. Am I right or wrong? Vint Cerf? Uh, just a thought. I, it seems to me that much of what we're talking about has a great deal to do with the society that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And that in, invariably invokes societal conventions. Some of those are conventions that say, in our society, these things we consider harmful and we will try to do things to mitigate those harms. One of the big challenges that we have in this uh, arena is to discover what things we choose to hold in common on a global scale. This is very difficult because of variations in culture, history, and, and uh, geography. But I think that's what we need to go after. And I wanted to draw your attention to a phenomenon that uh, hasn't been mentioned yet. We've been having these meetings on an annual basis. They started in 2006. Did you notice what happened without any particular top-down um, you know, ruling energy or planning, but regional and national IGFs popped up like mushrooms after mm -hmm. a spring rain. It's important that that happened. What it means is that there is conversation going on, not just in this annual meeting, but in other places during the course of the year, out of the sheer desire to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that we're smart enough to get insight from what those conversations have revealed, and that will help us discover what we choose to hold in common. Mm, thank you. Mrs. Uh, Esther Yusen. Um, yes, I think you're right. There's some commonality, but, but maybe also different approaches about mm -hmm. how to take this forward. I, d I want to respond to Mr. Ismailov first. I think he's absolutely right. I think the internet does pose challenges that we should be approaching with a a research agenda that we talk about together with looking at, at the need for, for, for regulations, for how we apply existing laws effectively. I think um, um, your proposal that this should happen within the UN system, my response would be that the IGF is inside the UN. And I think if, if we're not able to use this forum effectively to, to um, provide that kind of platform. I'm not sure that we need another new mechanism within the UN. I think with regard to the Geneva Convention, I think it's been really interesting and courageous of Microsoft to put this forward. And um, I'm not sure that, that we're ready for a convention, but I think the process of beginning to mm. talk about shared norms um, and to, to consolidate an understanding of the internet as a public commonly owned entity, and as I said earlier today, not public as in controlled by governments, but public as in us, as, mm. as, in, as common to all of us. Mm. That I do think is a useful um, initiative. Thank you for your reaction. Mr. Liu, just ask, sorry, for Thank the you. microphone. Thank you. I think, actually, as I 
mentioned during my opening remarks, there should be global governance. Mm. Because if you compare <coughs> internet regulation with uh, civil aviation, with the road system, transportation, you know, for civil aviation, it developed so fast, it's due to the international regulation. Because the people feel it's safe. Safety, security, is the development of any technology. Hmm. That's why I think be for, 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 the, for, for the internet, there definitely there must be international, a global system. Hmm. But I know that be, is, there is a difficult. I think be, we need to realize challenges now we are facing. That's why I think that be, we started not with the intergovernmental negotiations, we started multi-stakeholder, this dialogue. So that's why I think be, I, my advice to that be, we may make good use of this multi-stakeholder IGF to develop ideas, to find out the issues that be, really where, which area we need to regulate first. Mm. I think be, it's not easy and not good to start that you are going to have a comprehensive convention, comprehensive treaty. That would be too early to say that. But you need to say that be, which area you need to regulate. But probably in 10 years. Yeah. Let's say, people say that be, I think there are also a, for the business, this, business sector, mm. for the scientific community, they need to say that be some kind of prediction that they will have a very secure environment to invest, to develop. I think, but the most important for the people, for the users, for the users, I think our policy would be maybe by 2027, 20, which are six billion users, but we need to say that be, this internet system would be secure and safe. Mm -hmm. Because people are worried, internet, if without any international regulation, maybe our national security will be threatened, maybe community security will be threatened, maybe a banking system will be threatened. That's why the security safety becoming one of the challenging issues. So that's why I think be, I hope it will be, this is a, the IGF is a multi-stakeholder forum that be people from, the experts from different forums to identify that which areas we need the urgent response. Mm -hmm. And that we need a plan we need a strategy for the, for the regulation for, for future. Thank you. Thank you. So we have global governance, but we also have micro governance, governance uh, because we understand that it can be very efficient to work on a smaller scale. Uh, and we have common values, some of them. So I, I feel that we are progressing. I know you would all like to add something. I just want to go back to the audience because I did say that we would be interactive. And, but w we will go back to this. Probably one question about, um, uh, you know, what we've just heard. We have one question here, sir, or comment. Okay. It's Hi. actually it's two questions, and it's for everyone in the room. So the first question is, um, who thinks um, that you know uh, what the citizens of your country wishes for internet governance in 10 years? And I wouldn't raise my hand. So who <coughs> raises his or her hand in the room? Nobody. Okay, nobody. So, second question. We wish that in 10 years, when we met, we would know about what the citizens of the world wish for internet governance. And I wish that. And I wish mm. that uh, we would have 200, 300 citizens of the world here in the room giving their recommendations to the stakeholders about what they wish and what they want for the future of governance of internet. And there are tools for that. And I think we'd like some reactions from the panel if you think that this is a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. But civil society is one of the multi-stakeholders, isn't it? Thank you, yes. That was another statement from civil society. Cathy Brown. Mrs. Brown, please. Thank you. Thank you for that very much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. In the last 18 months, the, uh, the Internet Society has conducted interviews around the world, um, and I would uh, ask you to take a look at our, our uh, global Internet report this year. And we asked our wider community, uh, amongst which were uh, technologists and scientists and civil society and human rights and, and business, 
what did they think was going to happen with the internet and what are they worried about? What are they happy about? What do they see are the opportunities? And what are they worried about? But do they share the same worries that we've expressed today? Well, what's interesting to me is that nobody thought that making a law was going to um, <laughs> help, was actually going to be the answer to what they're worried about. What they're worried about is that the, the control of their lives, the ability to use this amazing um, uh, tool, this, this place where they live, um, will be somehow taken away or, or uh, taken control by other entities, number one, big worry. What they believe could happen is that it becomes the tool for the empowerment you're talking about and that you want so much, and that there's this list of things that, are, are, uh, that have to happen in order for the good things to happen and the bad things not. But what they want is a seat at the table. They want a seat at the table. They want to be part of that decision making. But you're a representative. Second point, this is not a representative issue. I don't represent anybody except myself. I can tell you what the community thinks about. They are willing and want to engage with those who make decisions. Second point, governments do not make every decision about our lives, please. And yet, the internet is in every part of our lives. So this notion, I get very nervous that we think that the conversation we're having here about what is government control all about is the whole question. It is not. Mm -hmm. There are issues that need to be uh, resolved at different layers, different levels mm -hmm. of the internet that have nothing to do with the government, that have to do with the technical way the, the internet operates, the way we live, the way we want to run our communities, our schools, the way we want to actually drive a car, the way we want to get our, our information from our doctors? How are we going to solve those things? And with all due respect, I don't think it's with a global treaty. We mm. may well have some issues on war and peace. We may some have some issues on conventions of what is a, a, a way to think about the public internet, the core of the internet, that it may do well for us to get to agreement. There is a commission right now on the stability of cyberspace. That seems to me a good conversation to have, but we are so early in that conversation. And I think what the question that was posed here, do we all know what everybody thinks? We have some ideas what people think. Do we know enough to make a law to say this is now how we shall all go mm. forward? I'm not so sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, Mr. Okay. Temin. Yeah, so I, I just like to add a few words. Here, cybersecurity is a very important issue. And uh, IT has worked on this uh, since the last two decades. And the first decade, uh, we worked uh, among telecom engineers, among ourselves. So we consider it's not enough. So therefore, ITU in 1998 uh, suggested to the United Nations to organize a WISIS process to engage more stakeholders to come to this point. So we are, we are very pleased to see that WISIS process will now be continued, and not only for the last 10 years, but for the next 10 years as well. So that is great. And then, you know, that uh, in 2007, we, ITU, organized a high-level expert uh, for the cybersecurity agenda. And we had uh, several key experts in the room to, as our part of that uh, group. And that idea to have a Geneva Convention was already raised then by some uh, great uh, judge from, uh, from, uh, from the market. And then we discovered that it's not easy. This is uh, inside, within our families, is, there's no uh, general agreement. So there are different opinions. And then we try to see if we can get uh, some kind of uh, uh, easy area we can move ahead, like uh, child online protection. And then child online protection is uh, the area people all agree that uh, pornography is not good for the child, so we can reach some agreement. Mm -hmm. But again, here you have some difficulties. You cannot uh, rear it. And uh, this issue is still in a hot topic uh, in ITU, but also in the world everywhere. But today I'm very pleased to see that this issue is no longer for the telecom engineer, telecom authority, but also you go to the prime minister's office, president's office, you know, that is very high. And also that uh, 
uh, in, in, inside IT, when we talked about that, we heard uh, still different opinions from different uh, member states, but we never heard mm -hmm. such kind of uh, public call from uh, big companies like uh, Microsoft. So that, uh, you know, we have to, 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 it's the first time for me to hear this kind of a call from, mm -hmm. uh, from industry. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd like to also have uh, further studies and try to get uh, some more information from them, you know, why. I know that the Microsoft play very important important roles inside the United States mm. for government, uh, for industries. So that, uh, you know, we like to, 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 to see what, what, uh, what the... the but we, we are talking about the 10 next years, so we have time to think yeah, about it. Yeah. I'd like to go back to what the people think, what they don't want. They don't want governments to always rule their lives. They probably don't want the gaffers either, Facebook and Google and Twitter to uh, uh, take all their private da data. Uh, how do you protect the people then? This is well, Puri. We or help the people rather than pretend. We certainly know what women want. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> I think so. <coughs> I think so. They want Let's hear governance. I mean, there are three aspects of governance that we think women want and deserve. One relates to access, which we have talked about. The digital divide is growing. That's one. The second aspect of governance is how can governance in the way that governments regulate, in the way that private sector acts or social media platforms operate and regulate, self-regulate maybe, but how they govern, how does that really help them to be empowered, to have, uh, to benefit fully from the internet. And the third aspect of governance is how does, you know, we talked about earlier, there were questions about offline and online realities. Mm. And how does the offline reality get translated into online? Or either it becomes worse or it becomes better. Now, what they would also want is that internet governance be such that the cyber threats that women face, the new forms of violence, harassment, harmful uh, stereotypes that the internet is perpetuating is something that they would want regulation to address. Mm -hmm. So certainly we, we know and we feel that these are the three major areas where women and girls want mm -hmm. internet governance to deliver. Thank you very much. Vint Cerf, on uh, you know, what, what people, what users really uh, want. We're talking about women in a sense of a, a community that needs protection. And, but going back to the civil society as well, that, you know, that Sir Cathy Bren was m mentioning, uh, can we hear, can we uh, do something about what people want, what the users want? Well, I'm not going to try to speak for everyone in the whole world, but I will tell well, you, you are, what I would you like. Are, I'll tell you, you what Google. I would like. I would like to feel safer yeah. in the online environment. Mm -hmm. I would like the technologists to help me get there. I would like to learn practices that will make me feel and actually be safer. I would like companies to feel some pressure uh, to behave in a way that also improves my sense of safety and trust. This is um, a very shared responsibility across all layers of this architecture. Uh, every actor in the system has a role to play to achieve an internet that we can feel comfortable using and that we can build on. And we aren't there, but we have gone a long way from the three networks that we demonstrated in 1977. <laughs> And so I have the feeling that we have the capacity to do this if we have the will to do this. But who, who would give the good practices, for, for instance? I'm sorry, who would... You, you said, who would deliver the good practices? You said, as a user, I would like to have, uh, you know, to know about good practices to have a safe environment. Who should give these good practices? Companies? Well, actually, governments? Uh, actually, there are a variety of sources, right? That my company tries to help people do a better job of using the network safely. We give them technology to do that. We give them two-factor mm -hmm. authentication. We insist on using cryptography. So I think the corporations that offer service 
have a, a, a role to play mm -hmm. to educate people. Mm -hmm. But our entire educational system has to start very early on, not only with teaching people practices to do safe networking, but also, and I will say this over and over again, to think about what they're seeing and hearing in this environment. Because if we don't learn how to think critically, we are going to become very confused. Mm. Can Thank I you. Quickly to that question, I agree completely yes. with what Mrs. Vincent said. And your question about the good practices, I think they emerge from collaboration between technical people and human rights people, yes, and so between don't. users. Mm. And I think users want more than just a seat at the table. I do think they want to be empowered and know that their rights will be respected. And I think. The, the comment from the floor is a really important one. Are we using our technology that we're creating enough to deepen democracy and deepen governance um, and make it more inclusive, not just in the internet, but, but in the world at large? Um, and we spent, I think, more time now about how to apply um, conventional models of governance to the internet than really using its potential to make it more inclusive and more accountable. Thank you. We're, we're getting close to the end of our panel. I would like to ask the other ministers in the room on the floor if they would like to uh, add a comment or a remark to the debate. Jovan, have we got some uh, remarks from the audience outside the room? Uh, no, no major prophecies from the online participants, <laughs> But probably your own prophecies. Uh, but there are a few comments on, uh, on the, uh, the regulation, some uh, <coughs> Twitter uh, uh, tweets arguing that it is not possible to regulate unique space of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, online communication, and the other basically arguing that the, it's a matter of time when we are going to get a uh, treaty. Uh, some comments uh, summarize that it's premature now, based on discussion on day zero. Those were two uh, group of comments. It's not possible to regulate. It is. It's in almost inevitable, but it is just a matter of time when we are going to get a treaty. Those are two Main uh, major. Yes. Thank you very much. It's not very surprisingly. There you go. Exactly. Uh, as I said, we, 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 yes, please, Minister of Bangladesh. Well, uh, is it working? Yes, it is. It, it's working. Uh, well, uh, uh, I mentioned in my opening uh, sentences that uh, uh, the digital space created by digitization should be secured. Mm. And the national governments are going for uh, laws and rules and regulations and act. But since uh, internet is a, uh, is a cross-border technology, a digital space, so we need a global governance on the security issue. That is why I said a cyberspace treaty needs to be developed gradually. What Microsoft said, well, to start with, we can start the discussion by convening a convention, and then the issues will be tabled there. There are two aspects. One is criminals, another is cyber war. Cyber war is, mm. is waged by states against states, against politicians by another politicians, mm -hmm. or overt and covert. So cyber wars, that is a very tricky area, how to demilitarize the cyber space. So when you ask for the the safety and security of the cyberspace, the many aspects will come. Yes. We can start the discussion by convening a con mm -hmm. Geneva Convention, uh, mm -hmm. and it is appropriate that IGF can do the lead, take the lead. Mm. But uh, my understanding is, uh, in 10 years' time, definitely we need a global cyberspace treaty, which will be an umbrella treaty to give a safeguard direction to the nation states. That is one thing. Another thing is very important, which we have not discussed much in this uh, uh, house, digital economy. She is the commissioner of the European digital, uh, digital economy. Economy is one thing, but digital internet is creating its own economy. Mm -hmm. That is, we call digital economy. It has its own parameters and own opportunities and constants. In Bangladesh, what we are facing now, we are developing e-commerce. So more than 700 e-commerce companies are functioning, but without a management regulatory body. Now I say, say a framework is necessary for digital economy only across the world. And for that wise, to harmonize national regulation versus global business objectives and cross-border digital trade. 
concentration of global north i hope you don't mind concentration of global north based international e-commerce is a threat to the tax revenues of the global south i come from south this needs to have a fair and equitable collection and distribution of tax revenues around the world and to achieve that united nations should initiate this digital economy framework Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the debate, so uh, I'm afraid we, we won't uh, have much time left. I would like you to try and answer, I mean, even Twitter is going long now in words, so I don't know how to start this, but uh, give me one word, maximum five, on your dream in 10 years. We're all back here on stage, and there's one thing you're hoping uh, to, be, to, to achieve about digital governance. What would it be the main, the main challenge for you? Kitty Brown. <laughs> I would truly like to see us using the tools of the 21st century to arrive at collaborative decision making inside of government, but outside of government as well uh, for all of the communities. Thank you, Eric Loeb. I'd say aggregation of marginal gains. <laughs> and I say this because of the belief that rather than trying to solve things in one grand comprehensive place, often that can result in a least common denominator. However, there is the possibility to steadily address issues, make marginal gains that add up to a significant improvement. Thank you. Mrs. Puri using the digital revolution and parity democracy within that to really deliver on the greatest project for humanity in the 21st century, which is gender equality and women's empowerment. Thank you. Well, internet, well internet empowers people and women also. So <laughs> uh, the future is empowerment of people through internet and the people should be secured and safe. Thank you very much. Safety, thank you. Mr. Yeah, more Jones. advanced uh, internet uh, services beneficial to everybody. To everybody, thank you. Mr. Liu. I think uh, promote uh, dig digital governance or internet governance progressively to, s to secure that the digital economy benefit the whole mankind. Thank you. Thank you. Inclusive speech. Mrs. Gabrielle. Économie et société numérique basée sur une coopération renforcée avec des responsabilités claires dans lesquelles l'éducation, les compétences numériques et l'inclusion ont un rôle central pour pouvoir garder le visage humain de notre futur. Thank you. Mr. Tominaga. Yes, I would say a harmonization of digital governance for the benefit for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Benefit for everyone. Henriette. Privacy, uh, security, trust human rights, collaboration around the internet as a public entity that belongs to all of us and should be governed by us collaboratively. Thank you. Mr. Vincent. In 10 years' time, the internet really is for everyone. For everyone. Internet for everyone. I think we've heard it uh, from all of you. So shall we keep that as our key message tonight? And uh, I thank you all, of course, the audience in the room, outside the room, the minister and all our special guests, and of course, our panelists, a big applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. I, I kindly invite you to, or should you stay, Chengatai will probably tell me if you want. To. Ah, there you are. We have, Thank you. So let's go on this side. <laughs> this is a bit chaotic. Can I just ask you to leave the stage so that we can have uh, the rest? Yes, please. Thank I will come to you. Thank you ever so much. I'll go back to you. Be very 
It's working now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much. We are now going. In your bags, you'll find an invitation to the host country reception, which is um, sponsored by the State Council of the Republic and Canton of Geneva, and also the Executive Council. Um, this is the directions in case you don't know, but I'm sure you can follow people who do know where it is. It's at WIPO. Uh, you can leave through the gate, the, this gate, and you can walk down uh, next to ITU across the road. Uh, if you have any questions, I am sure there's people here who are very, very familiar with Geneva and can also direct you. Thank you.